Clipper Audio presents an unabridged recording of Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, narrated by Virginia Leishman. This book is copyrighted 1953 by Leonard Woolf. This recording is copyrighted 2002 by Recorded Books. Like James Joyce's Ulysses, which Virginia Woolf read with great reluctance, her novel, Mrs. Dalloway, attempts to convey the intimate particulars of a single human consciousness over the course of one day. As Clarissa Dalloway prepares her house for a small party, her mind dips in and out of her life's course, grinding into the realities of its crueler occasions, war and loss, before bursting afresh with the sudden recall of some beautiful kindness or love, while smiles flicker in the brain and fade out at the memories of old jokes and friends. Communication is health, one of the characters thinks, and what Virginia Woolf tried to communicate for the wholeness of her reader's perception was the nature of the mind entire. One of the major literary figures of the 20th century, Virginia Woolf applied her experimental techniques to the rendering of human consciousness in such groundbreaking works as To the Lighthouse, Jacob's Room and The Waves. When asked about her artistic intentions, Woolf wrote, I have to create the whole thing afresh for myself each time. Probably all writers are in the same boat. It is the penalty we pay for breaking with tradition and the solitude makes the writing more exciting, though the being read less so. One ought to sink to the bottom of the sea, probably, and live alone with one's words. Virginia Woolf committed suicide by drowning in 1941. And now, Mrs. Dalloway. Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself, for Lucy had her work cut out for her. The doors would be taken off their hinges, Rumpelmeyer's men were coming. And then, thought Clarissa Dalloway, what a morning, fresh as if issued to children on a beach. What a lark, what a plunge. For so it had always seemed to her, when, with a little squeak of the hinges, which she could hear now, she had burst open the French windows and plunged at Borton into the open air. How fresh, how calm, stiller than this, of course, the air was in the early morning, like the flap of a wave, the kiss of a wave, chill and sharp, and yet, for a girl of eighteen as she then was, solemn feeling as she did, standing there at the open window, that something awful was about to happen. Looking at the flowers, at the trees with the smoke winding off them, and the rooks rising, falling, standing and looking until Peter Walsh said, musing among the vegetables. Was that it? I prefer men to cauliflowers. Was that it? He must have said it at breakfast one morning when she had gone out onto the terrace, Peter Walsh. He would be back from India one of these days, June or July, she forgot which, for his letters were awfully dull. It was his sayings one remembered, his eyes, his pocket knife, his smile, his grumpiness, and when millions of things had utterly vanished, how strange it was, a few sayings like this about cabbages. She stiffened a little on the curb, waiting for Dirtnell's van to pass. A charming woman, Scrope Purvis thought her, knowing her as one does people who live next door to one in Westminster. A touch of the bird about her, of the jay, blue-green, light, vivacious, though she was over fifty and grown very white since her illness. There she perched, never seeing him, waiting to cross, very upright, for having lived in Westminster, how many years now? Over twenty. One feels, even in the midst of the traffic, or waking at night, Clarissa was positive, a particular hush or solemnity, an indescribable pause, a suspense, but that might be her heart, affected, they said, by influenza, before Big Ben strikes. 
There, out it boomed. First a warning, musical, then the hour, irrevocable. The leaden circles dissolved in the air. Such fools we are, she thought, crossing Victoria Street. For heaven only knows why one loves it so, how one sees it so, making it up, building it round one, tumbling it, creating it every moment afresh. But the veriest frumps, the most dejected of miseries, sitting on doorsteps, drink their downfall, do the same. Can't be dealt with, she felt positive, by acts of Parliament for that very reason. They love life. In people's eyes, in the swing, tramp and trudge, in the bellow and the uproar, the carriages, motor cars, omnibuses, vans, sandwich men shuffling and swinging, brass bands, barrel organs, in the triumph and the jingle and the strange high singing of some aeroplane overhead was what she loved. Life. London. This moment of June. For it was the middle of June. The war was over, except for someone like Mrs. Foxcroft at the embassy last night, eating her heart out because that nice boy was killed and now the old manor house must go to a cousin. Or Lady Bexborough, who opened a bazaar, they said, with the telegram in her hand, John, her favourite, killed. But it was over. Thank heaven, over. It was June. The king and queen were at the palace. And everywhere, though it was still so early, there was a beating, a stirring of galloping ponies, tapping of cricket bats, Lords, Ascot, Ranelagh, and all the rest of it, wrapped in the soft mesh of the grey-blue morning air, which, as the day wore on, would unwind them and set down on their lawns and pitches, the bouncing ponies whose forefeet just struck the ground and up they sprung, the whirling young men and laughing girls in their transparent muslins, who, even now, after dancing all night, were taking their absurd woolly dogs for a run. And even now, at this hour, discreet old dowagers were shooting out in their motor-cars on errands of mystery, and the shopkeepers were fidgeting in their windows with their paste and diamonds, their lovely old sea-green brooches in eighteenth-century settings to tempt Americans, one must economise, not buy things rashly for Elizabeth. And she, too, loving it as she did with an absurd and faithful passion, being part of it, since her people were courtiers once in the time of the Georges, she, too, was going that very night to kindle and illuminate, to give her party. But how strange, on entering the park, the silence, the mist, the hum the slow-swimming happy ducks, the pouched birds waddling. And who should be coming along with his back against the government buildings, most appropriately, carrying a dispatch box stamped with the royal arms? Who but Hugh Whitbread, her old friend Hugh, the admirable Hugh? "'Good morning to you, Clarissa,' said Hugh rather extravagantly, for they had known each other as children. "'Where are you off to?' I love walking in London, said Mrs. Dalloway. Really, it's better than walking in the country. They had just come up, unfortunately, to see doctors. Other people came to see pictures, go to the opera, take their daughters out. The Whitbreads came to see doctors. Times without number, Clarissa had visited Evelyn Whitbread in a nursing home. Was Evelyn ill again? Evelyn was a good deal out of sorts, said Hugh, intimating by a kind of pout or swell of his very well-covered, manly, extremely handsome, perfectly upholstered body. He was almost too well-dressed, always, but presumably had to be with his little job at court. That his wife had some internal ailment, nothing serious, which, as an old friend, Clarissa Dalloway would quite understand without requiring him to specify. Ah, yes, she did, of course. What a nuisance, and felt very sisterly and oddly conscious at the same time of her hat. Not the right hat for the early morning. Was that it? 
for Hugh always made her feel, as he bustled on, raising his hat rather extravagantly and assuring her that she might be a girl of eighteen, and of course he was coming to her party tonight, Evelyn absolutely insisted, only a little late he might be after the party at the palace to which she had to take one of Jim's boys. She always felt a little skimpy beside Hugh, schoolgirlish, but attached to him, partly from having known him always, but she did think him a good sort in his own way, though Richard was nearly driven mad by him, and as for Peter Walsh, he had never to this day forgiven her for liking him. She could remember scene after scene at Borton, Peter furious, Hugh not, of course, his match in any way, but still not a positive imbecile, as Peter made out, not a mere barber's block. When his old mother wanted him to give up shooting or to take her to Bath, he did it without a word. He was really unselfish. And as for saying, as Peter did, that he had no heart, no brain, nothing but the manners and breeding of an English gentleman, that was only her dear Peter at his worst. And he could be intolerable. He could be impossible. But adorable to walk with on a morning like this. June had drawn out every leaf on the trees. The mothers of Pimlico gave suck to their young. Messages were passing from the fleet to the Admiralty. Arlington Street and Piccadilly seemed to chafe the very air in the park and lift its leaves hotly, brilliantly, on waves of that divine vitality which Clarissa loved. To dance, to ride, she had adored all that. For they might be parted for hundreds of years, she and Peter. She never wrote a letter, and his were dry sticks. But suddenly it would come over her. If he were with me now, what would he say? Some days, some sights bringing him back to her calmly, without the old bitterness, which perhaps was the reward of having cared for people. They came back in the middle of St. James's Park on a fine morning, Indeed, they did. But Peter, however beautiful the day might be, and the trees and the grass and the little girl in pink, Peter never saw a thing of all that. He would put on his spectacles if she told him to. He would look. It was the state of the world that interested him. Wagner, Pope's poetry, people's characters eternally, and the defects of her own soul. How he scolded her. How they argued. She would marry a prime minister and stand at the top of a staircase. The perfect hostess, he called her. She had cried over it in her bedroom. She had the makings of the perfect hostess, he said. So she would still find herself arguing in St. James's Park, still making out that she had been right, and she had, too, not to marry him. For in marriage, a little license a little independence there must be between people living together day in, day out in the same house, which Richard gave her, and she him. Where was he this morning, for instance? Some committee, she never asked what. But with Peter, everything had to be shared, everything gone into. And it was intolerable. And when it came to that scene in the little garden by the fountain, she had to break with him, or they would have been destroyed, both of them ruined, she was convinced. Though she had borne about with her for years, like an arrow sticking in her heart, the grief, the anguish, and then the horror of the moment when someone told her at a concert that he had married a woman met on the boat going to India. Never should she forget all that. Cold, heartless, a prude, he called her. Never could she understand how he cared. But those Indian women did, presumably. Silly, pretty, flimsy nincompoops. And she wasted her pity. For he was quite happy, he assured her, perfectly happy, though he had never done a thing that they talked of. His whole life had been a failure. It made her angry still. She had reached the park gates. She stood for a moment, looking at the omnibuses in Piccadilly. She would not say of anyone in the world now that they were this or were that. She felt very young, 
at the same time unspeakably aged. She sliced like a knife through everything, at the same time was outside looking on. She had a perpetual sense, as she watched the taxicabs, of being out, out, far out to sea and alone. She always had the feeling that it was very, very dangerous to live even one day. Not that she thought herself clever or much out of the ordinary. How she had got through life on the few twigs of knowledge Fräulein Daniels gave them, she couldn't think. She knew nothing. No language, no history. She scarcely read a book now, except memoirs in bed. And yet to her, it was absolutely absorbing, all this. The cabs passing. And she would not say of Peter. She would not say of herself. I am this, I am that. Her only gift was knowing people almost by instinct, she thought, walking on. If you put her in a room with someone, up went her back like a cat's, or she purred. Devonshire House, Bath House, the house with the china cockatoo, she'd seen them all lit up once, and remembered Sylvia, Fred, Sally Seaton, such hosts of people, and dancing all night, and the wagons plodding past to market, and driving home across the park. She remembered once throwing a shilling into the serpentine, but everyone remembered. What she loved was this, here, now, in front of her, the fat lady in the cab. Did it matter, then, she asked herself, walking towards Bond Street, did it matter that she must inevitably cease completely? All this must go on without her. Did she resent it? Or did it not become consoling to believe that death ended absolutely but that somehow, in the streets of London, on the ebb and flow of things, here, there, she survived. Peter survived, lived in each other, she being part, she was positive, of the trees at home, of the house there, ugly, rambling all to bits and pieces as it was, part of people she had never met, being laid out like a mist between the people she knew best, who lifted her on their branches as she had seen the trees lift the mist. But it spread ever so far, her life, herself. But what was she dreaming as she looked into Hatchard's shop window? What was she trying to recover? What image of white dawn in the country? As she read in the book spread open, Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages, this late age of the world's experience had bred in them all, all men and women, a well of tears. Tears and sorrows, courage and endurance, a perfectly upright and stoical bearing. Think, for example, of the woman she admired most, Lady Bexborough, opening the bazaar. There were Jorrocks, jaunts and jollities, there were Soapy Sponge and Mrs. Asquith's memoirs and big game shooting in Nigeria, all spread open. Ever so many books there were, but none that seemed exactly right to take to Evelyn Whitbread in her nursing home. Nothing that would serve to amuse her and make that indescribably dried-up little woman look, as Clarissa came in, just for a moment cordial before they settled down for the usual interminable talk of women's ailments. How much she wanted it, that people should look pleased as she came in, Clarissa thought, and turned and walked back towards Bond Street, annoyed, because it was silly to have other reasons for doing things. Much rather would she have been one of those people like Richard, who did things for themselves, whereas she thought, waiting to cross, Half the time she did things not simply, not for themselves, but to make people think this or that. Perfect idiocy, she knew, and now the policeman held up his hand, for no one was ever for a second taken in. Oh, if she could have had her life over again, she thought, stepping onto the pavement, could have looked even differently. She would have been, in the first place, dark like Lady Bexborough, with a skin of crumpled leather and beautiful eyes, 
She would have been, like Lady Bexborough, slow and stately, rather large, interested in politics like a man, with a country house, very dignified, very sincere. Instead of which, she had a narrow pea-stick figure, a ridiculous little face, beaked like a bird's. That she held herself well was true, and had nice hands and feet, and dressed well, considering that she spent little. But often now, this body she wore, she stopped to look at a Dutch picture, this body, with all its capacities, seemed nothing, nothing at all. She had the oddest sense of being herself invisible, unseen, unknown. There being no more marrying, no more having of children now, but only this astonishing and rather solemn progress with the rest of them up Bond Street, this being Mrs. Dalloway, not even Clarissa any more, this being Mrs. Richard Dalloway. Bond Street fascinated her. Bond Street early in the morning in the season. Its flags flying, its shops, no splash, no glitter. One roll of tweed in the shop where her father had bought his suits for fifty years. A few pearls, salmon on an ice block. That is all, she said, looking at the fishmongers. That is all, she repeated, pausing for a moment at the window of a glove shop where, before the war, you could buy almost perfect gloves. And her old Uncle William used to say, a lady is known by her shoes and her gloves. He had turned on his bed one morning in the middle of the war. He had said, I have had enough. Gloves and shoes. She had a passion for gloves, but her own daughter, her Elizabeth, cared not a straw for either of them. Not a straw, she thought, going on up Bond Street to a shop where they kept flowers for her when she gave a party. Elizabeth really cared for her dog, most of all. The whole house this morning smelt of tar. Still, better poor Grizzle than Miss Kilman. Better distemper and tar and all the rest of it than sitting mewed in a stuffy bedroom with a prayer book. Better anything, she was inclined to say, but it might be only a phase, as Richard said, such as all girls go through. It might be falling in love. But why with Miss Kilman, who had been badly treated, of course, one must make allowances for that, and Richard said she was very able, had a really historical mind. Anyhow, they were inseparable, and Elizabeth, her own daughter, went to communion, and how she dressed, how she treated people who came to lunch, she didn't care a bit, being her experience that the religious ecstasy made people callous. So did causes. Dulled their feelings. For Miss Kilman would do anything for the Russians, starved herself for the Austrians, but in private inflicted positive torture, so insensitive was she, dressed in a green Mackintosh coat. Year in, year out, she wore that coat. She perspired. She was never in the room five minutes without making you feel her superiority, your inferiority. How poor she was, how rich you were, how she lived in a slum without a cushion or a bed or a rug or whatever it might be, all her soul rusted with that grievance sticking in it, her dismissal from school during the war, poor, embittered, unfortunate creature. For it was not her one hated, but the idea of her, which undoubtedly had gathered into itself a great deal that was not Miss Kilman, had become one of those spectres with which one battles in the night, one of those spectres who stand astride us and suck up half our lifeblood, dominators and tyrants. For no doubt, with another throw of the dice, had the black been uppermost and not the white, she would have loved Miss Kilman. But not in this world. No. It rasped her, though, to have stirring about in her this brutal monster, to hear twigs cracking and feel hooves planted down in the depths of that leaf-encumbered forest, the soul. 
never to be content quite, or quite secure, for at any moment the brute would be stirring, this hatred, which, especially since her illness, had power to make her feel scraped, hurt in her spine, gave her physical pain, and made all pleasure in beauty, in friendship, in being well, in being loved and making her home delightful, rock, quiver and bend, as if indeed there were a monster grubbing at the roots, as if the whole panoply of content were nothing but self-love, this hatred. Nonsense, nonsense, she cried to herself, pushing through the swing doors of Mulberry's The Florists. She advanced, light, tall, very upright, to be greeted at once by button-faced Miss Pym, whose hands were always bright red, as if they had been stood in cold water with the flowers. There were flowers, delphiniums, sweet peas, bunches of lilac, and carnations, masses of carnations. There were roses, there were irises. Ah, yes. So she breathed in the earthy garden sweet smell as she stood talking to Miss Pym, who owed her help, and thought her kind for kind she had been years ago. Very kind, but she looked older this year, turning her head from side to side among the irises and roses and nodding tufts of lilac with her eyes half closed, snuffing in, after the street uproar, the delicious scent, the exquisite coolness. And then, opening her eyes, how fresh, like frilled linen cleaned from a laundry laid in wicker trays, the roses looked, and dark and prim the red carnations holding their heads up, and all the sweet peas spreading in their bowls, tinged violet, snow-white, pale, as if it were the evening, and girls in muslin frocks came out to pick sweet peas and roses, after the superb summer's day, with its almost blue-black sky, its delphiniums, its carnations, its arum lilies, was over. And it was the moment between six and seven, when every flower, roses, carnations, irises, lilac, glows. White, violet, red, deep orange. Every flower seems to burn by itself, softly, purely in the misty beds and how she loved the grey-white moths spinning in and out over the jerry pie, over the evening primroses. And as she began to go with Miss Pym from jar to jar, choosing, Nonsense, nonsense, she said to herself more and more gently, as if this beauty, this scent, this colour, and Miss Pym liking her, trusting her, were a wave which she let flow over her and surmount that hatred, that monster, surmount it all, and it lifted her up and up when, oh, a pistol shot in the street outside. Dear, those motor cars, said Miss Pym, going to the window to look, and coming back and smiling apologetically with her hands full of sweet peas, as if those motor cars, those tyres of motor cars, were all her fault. The violent explosion which made Mrs. Dalloway jump and Miss Pym go to the window and apologise came from a motor car which had drawn to the side of the pavement precisely opposite Mulberry's shop window. Passers by, who of course stopped and stared, had just time to see a face of the greatest importance against the dove grey upholstery before a male hand drew the blind, and there was nothing to be seen except a square of dove grey. Yet rumours were at once in circulation, from the middle of Bond Street to Oxford Street on one side, to Atkinson's scent shop on the other, passing invisibly, inaudibly, like a cloud, swift, veil-like upon hills, falling indeed with something of a cloud's sudden sobriety and stillness, upon faces which a second before had been utterly disorderly. But now mystery had brushed them with her wing. They had heard the voice of authority. The spirit of religion was abroad with her eyes bandaged tight and her lips gaping wide. But nobody knew whose face had been seen. Was it the Prince of Wales, the Queen's, 
The Prime Minister's? Whose face was it? Nobody knew. Edgar J. Watkiss, with his roll of lead piping round his arm, said audibly, humorously of course, The Prime Minister's car. Septimus Warren Smith, who found himself unable to pass, heard him. Septimus Warren Smith, aged about 30, pale-faced, beak-nosed, wearing brown shoes and a shabby overcoat, with hazel eyes which had that look of apprehension in them which makes complete strangers apprehensive too. The world has raised its whip. Where will it descend? Everything had come to a standstill. The throb of the motor engine sounded like a pulse irregularly drumming through an entire body. The sun became extraordinarily hot because the motor car had stopped outside Mulberry's shop window. Old ladies on the tops of omnibuses spread their black parasols. Here a green, here a red parasol opened with a little pop. Mrs. Dalloway, coming to the window with her arms full of sweet peas, looked out with her little pink face pursed in inquiry. Everyone looked at the motor car. Septimus looked. Boys on bicycles sprang off. Traffic accumulated. And there the motor car stood, with drawn blinds, and upon them a curious pattern like a tree, Septimus thought, and this gradual drawing together of everything to one centre before his eyes, as if some horror had come almost to the surface and was about to burst into flames, terrified him. The world wavered and quivered and threatened to burst into flames. It is I who am blocking the way, he thought. Was he not being looked at and pointed at? Was he not waited there, rooted to the pavement, for a purpose? But for what purpose? Let us go on, Septimus, said his wife, a little woman, with large eyes and a sallow pointed face, an Italian girl. But Lucrezia herself couldn't help looking at the motor car and the tree pattern on the blinds. Was it the Queen in there? The Queen going shopping? The chauffeur, who had been opening something, turning something, shutting something, got onto the box. Come on, said Lucrezia. But her husband, for they had been married for five years now, jumped, started, and said, All right, angrily, as if she had interrupted him. People must notice. People must see. People, she thought, looking at the crowd staring at the motor car. The English people, with their children and their horses and their clothes, which she admired in a way. But they were people now, because Septimus had said, I will kill myself. An awful thing to say. Suppose they had heard him. She looked at the crowd. Help! Help! She wanted to cry out to butchers, boys and women. Help! Only last autumn she and Septimus had stood on the embankment, wrapped in the same cloak, and Septimus reading a paper instead of talking, she had snatched it from him and laughed in the old man's face who saw them. But failure one conceals. She must take him away into some park. Now we will cross, she said. She had a right to his arm, though it was without feeling. He would give her, who was so simple, so impulsive, only twenty-four, without friends in England, who had left Italy for his sake, a piece of bone. The motor car, with its blinds drawn and an air of inscrutable reserve, proceeded towards Piccadilly, still gazed at, still ruffling the faces on both sides of the street with the same dark breath of veneration, whether for Queen, Prince or Prime Minister, nobody knew. The face itself had been seen only once by three people for a few seconds. Even the sex was now in dispute. But there could be no doubt that greatness was seated within. Greatness was passing hidden down Bond Street, removed only by a hand's breadth from ordinary people who might now, for the first and last time, be within speaking distance of the majesty of England, 
of the enduring symbol of the state which will be known to curious antiquaries, sifting the ruins of time when London is a grass-grown path, and all those hurrying along the pavement this Wednesday morning are but bones with a few wedding rings mixed up in their dust and the gold stoppings of innumerable decayed teeth. The face in the motor car will then be known. It's probably the Queen, thought Mrs. Dalloway, coming out of Mulberry's with her flowers. The Queen. And for a second she wore a look of extreme dignity, standing by the flower shop in the sunlight, while the car passed at a foot's pace with its blinds drawn. The Queen going to some hospital. The Queen opening some bazaar, thought Clarissa. The crush was terrific for the time of day. Lords, Ascot, Hurlingham, what was it, she wondered, for the street was blocked. The British middle classes, sitting sideways on the tops of omnibuses with parcels and umbrellas, yes, even furs on a day like this, were, she thought, more ridiculous, more unlike anything there has ever been than one could conceive. And the Queen herself held up the Queen herself unable to pass. Clarissa was suspended on one side of Brook Street, Sir John Buckhurst, the old judge, on the other, with the car between them. Sir John had laid down the law for years and liked a well-dressed woman, when the chauffeur, leaning ever so slightly, said or showed something to the policeman, who saluted and raised his arm and jerked his head and moved the omnibus to the side, and the car passed through. Slowly and very silently, it took its way. Clarissa guessed. Clarissa knew, of course. She had seen something white, magical, circular, in the footman's hand, a disc inscribed with a name. The Queen's, the Prince of Wales, the Prime Minister's? which, by force of its own luster, burnt its way through. Clarissa saw the car diminishing, disappearing, to blaze among candelabras, glittering stars, breasts stiff with oak leaves, Hugh Whitbread and all his colleagues, the gentlemen of England, that night in Buckingham Palace. And Clarissa, too, gave a party. She stiffened a little so she would stand at the top of her stairs. The car had gone, but it had left a slight ripple which flowed through glove shops and hat shops and tailor's shops on both sides of Bond Street. For thirty seconds, all heads were inclined the same way, to the window. Choosing a pair of gloves, should they be to the elbow or above it, lemon or pale grey? Ladies stopped. When the sentence was finished, something had happened. Something so trifling in single instances that no mathematical instrument, though capable of transmitting shocks in China, could register the vibration. Yet, in its fullness, rather formidable, and in its common appeal, emotional. For in all the hat shops and tailor shops, strangers looked at each other, and thought of the dead, of the flag, of empire. In a public house in a back street, a colonial insulted the House of Windsor, which led to words, broken beer glasses, and a general shindy, which echoed strangely across the way in the ears of girls buying white underlinen threaded with pure white ribbon for their weddings. For the surface agitation of the passing car as it sunk grazed something very profound. Gliding across Piccadilly, the car turned down St. James's Street. Tall men, men of robust physique, well-dressed men with their tailcoats and their white slips and their hair raked back, who, for reasons difficult to discriminate, were standing in the bow window of Brooks, with their hands behind the tails of their coats, looking out perceived instinctively that greatness was passing, and the pale light of the immortal presence fell upon them as it had fallen upon Clarissa Dalloway. At once they stood even straighter, and removed their hands and seemed ready to attend their sovereign, if need be, to the cannon's mouth, as their ancestors had done before them. 
The white busts and the little tables in the background covered with copies of the Tatler and siphons of soda water seem to approve, seem to indicate the flowing corn and the manor houses of England. And to return the frail hum of the motor wheels as the walls of a whispering gallery return a single voice expanded and made sonorous by the might of a whole cathedral. Shawled Moll Pratt, with her flowers on the pavement, wished the dear boy well. It was the Prince of Wales for certain, and would have tossed the price of a pot of beer, a bunch of roses, into St. James's Street out of sheer light-heartedness and contempt of poverty, had she not seen the constable's eye upon her, discouraging an old Irishwoman's loyalty. The sentries at St. James's saluted. Queen Alexandra's policeman approved. A small crowd, meanwhile, had gathered at the gates of Buckingham Palace. Listlessly, yet confidently, poor people, all of them, they waited, looked at the palace itself with the flag flying, at Victoria billowing on her mound, admired her shelves of running water, her geraniums. Singled out from the motor cars in the mile, first this one, then that, bestowed emotion, vainly, upon commoners out for a drive, recalled their tribute to keep it unspent while this car passed and that, and all the time let rumour accumulate in their veins and thrill the nerves in their thighs at the thought of royalty looking at them, the queen bowing, the prince saluting, at the thought of the heavenly life divinely bestowed upon kings, of the equerries and deep curtsies, of the queen's old doll's house, of Princess Mary married to an Englishman, and the prince, ah, the prince, who took wonderfully, they said, after old King Edward, but was ever so much slimmer. The prince lived at St. James's, but he might come along in the morning to visit his mother. So Sarah Bletchley said, with her baby in her arms, tipping her foot up and down as though she were by her own fender in Pimlico, but keeping her eyes on the mow, while Emily Coates ranged over the palace windows and thought of the housemaids, the innumerable housemaids, the bedrooms, the innumerable bedrooms. Joined by an elderly gentleman with an Aberdeen terrier, by men without occupation, the crowd increased. Little Mr. Bowley, who had rooms in the Albany and was sealed with wax over the deeper sources of life, but could be unsealed suddenly, inappropriately, sentimentally by this sort of thing. Poor women waiting to see the Queen go past. Poor women, nice little children, orphans, widows, the war, tut tut, actually had tears in his eyes. A breeze flaunting ever so warmly down the mile through the thin trees, past the bronze heroes, lifted some flag flying in the British breast of Mr. Bowley, and he raised his hat as the car turned into the mile and held it high as the car approached, and let the poor mothers of Pimlico press close to him and stood very upright. The car came on. Suddenly Mrs. Coates looked up into the sky. The sound of an aeroplane bored ominously into the ears of the crowd. There it was coming over the trees, letting out white smoke from behind, which curled and twisted, actually writing something, making letters in the sky. Everyone looked up. Dropping dead down, the aeroplane soared straight up, curved in a loop, raced, sank, rose, and whatever it did, wherever it went, out fluttered behind it a thick ruffled bar of white smoke which curled and wreathed upon the sky in letters. But what letters? A C, was it? An E? Then an L? Only for a moment did they lie still. Then they moved and melted and were rubbed out up in the sky and the aeroplane shot further away and again, in a fresh space of sky, began writing a K. An E. A Y, perhaps? Glaxo, said Mrs. Coates in a strained, awe-stricken voice, gazing straight up, and her baby, lying stiff and white in her arms, gazed straight up. Cremo, 
murmured Mrs. Bletchley like a sleepwalker. With his hat held out perfectly still in his hand, Mr. Bowley gazed straight up. All down the mow, people were standing and looking up into the sky. As they looked, the whole world became perfectly silent, and a flight of gulls crossed the sky, first one gull leading, then another, and in this extraordinary silence and peace, in this pallor, in this purity, bells struck eleven times, the sound fading up there among the gulls. The aeroplane turned and raced and swooped exactly where it liked, swiftly, freely, like a skater. That's an E, said Mrs. Bletchley, or a dancer. It's toffee, murmured Mr. Bowley, and the car went in at the gates and nobody looked at it. And shutting off the smoke, away and away it rushed, and the smoke faded and assembled itself round the broad white shapes of the clouds. It had gone. It was behind the clouds. There was no sound. The clouds to which the letters E, G or L had attached themselves moved freely, as if destined to cross from west to east on a mission of the greatest importance which would never be revealed, and yet certainly so it was, a mission of the greatest importance. Then suddenly, as a train comes out of a tunnel, the aeroplane rushed out of the clouds again, the sound boring into the ears of all people in the mile, in the Green Park, in Piccadilly, in Regent Street, in Regent's Park, and the bar of smoke curved behind and it dropped down and it soared up and wrote one letter after another. But what word was it writing? Lucrezia Warren Smith, sitting by her husband's side on a seat in Regent's Park in the Broad Walk, looked up. Look, look, Septimus, she cried, for Dr. Holmes had told her to make her husband, who had nothing whatever seriously the matter with him, but was a little out of sorts, take an interest in things outside himself. So, thought Septimus, looking up, they are signalling to me. Not indeed in actual words. That is, he could not read the language yet. But it was plain enough, this beauty, this exquisite beauty, and tears filled his eyes as he looked at the smoke words languishing and melting in the sky and bestowing upon him in their inexhaustible charity and laughing goodness one shape after another of unimaginable beauty and signalling their intention to provide him for nothing, forever, for looking merely, with beauty, more beauty. Tears ran down his cheeks. It was toffee. They were advertising toffee, a nursemaid told Rezia. Together they began to spell T O F K R said the nursemaid, and Septimus heard her say K-R close to his ear, deeply, softly, like a mellow organ, but with a roughness in her voice like a grasshopper's, which rasped his spine deliciously and sent running up into his brain waves of sound which, concussing, broke. A marvellous discovery indeed, that the human voice in certain atmospheric conditions for one must be scientific, above all scientific, can quicken trees into life. Happily, Rezia put her hand with a tremendous weight on his knee, so that he was weighted down, transfixed, or the excitement of the elm trees rising and falling, rising and falling with all their leaves alight and the colour thinning and thickening from blue to the green of a hollow wave, like plumes on horses' heads, feathers on ladies, so proudly they rose and fell, so superbly, would have sent him mad. But he would not go mad. He would shut his eyes. He would see no more. But they beckoned. Leaves were alive, trees were alive, and the leaves being connected by millions of fibres with his own body, there on the seat, fanned it up and down. When the branch stretched, 
He, too, made that statement. The sparrows fluttering, rising and falling in jagged fountains were part of the pattern. The white and blue, barred with black branches. Sounds made harmonies with premeditation. The spaces between them were as significant as the sounds. A child cried. Rightly, far away, a horn sounded. All taken together meant the birth of a new religion. Septimus, said Rizia. He started violently. People must notice. I'm going to walk to the fountain and back, she said. For she could stand it no longer. Dr. Holmes might say there was nothing the matter. Far rather would she that he were dead. She could not sit beside him when he stared so and didn't see her and made everything terrible. Sky and tree, children playing, dragging carts, blowing whistles, falling down, all were terrible. And he would not kill himself, and she could tell no one. Septimus has been working too hard. That was all she could say to her own mother. To love makes one solitary, she thought. She could tell nobody, not even Septimus now. And looking back, she saw him sitting in his shabby overcoat, alone, on the seat, hunched up, staring. And it was cowardly for a man to say he would kill himself. But Septimus had fought. He was brave. He was not Septimus now. She put on her lace collar... She put on her new hat, and he never noticed. And he was happy without her. Nothing could make her happy without him. Nothing. He was selfish, so men are. For he was not ill. Dr. Holmes said there was nothing the matter with him. She spread her hand before her. Look. Her wedding ring slipped. She had grown so thin. It was she who suffered. But she had nobody to tell. Far was Italy, and the white houses, and the room where her sisters sat making hats, and the streets crowded every evening with people walking, laughing out loud, not half alive like people here, huddled up in bath chairs, looking at a few ugly flowers stuck in pots. For you should see the Milan gardens, she said aloud. But to whom? There was nobody. Her words faded. So a rocket fades. Its sparks, having grazed their way into the night, surrender to it. Dark descends, pours over the outlines of houses and towers. Bleak hillsides soften and fall in. But though they are gone, the night is full of them. Robbed of colour, blank of windows, they exist more ponderously, give out what the frank daylight fails to transmit. The trouble and suspense of things conglomerated there in the darkness, huddled together in the darkness, reft of the relief which dawn brings when, washing the walls white and grey, spotting each window pane, lifting the mist from the fields, showing the red-brown cows peacefully grazing, all is once more decked out to the eye, exists again. I am alone, I am alone, she cried by the fountain in Regent's Park, staring at the Indian and his cross, as perhaps at midnight, when all boundaries are lost, the country reverts to its ancient shape, as the Romans saw it, lying cloudy when they landed, and the hills had no names and rivers wound they knew not where. Such was her darkness, when suddenly... As if a shelf were shot forth and she stood on it, she said how she was his wife, married years ago in Milan, his wife, and would never, never tell that he was mad. Turning, the shelf fell. Down, down, she dropped. For he was gone, she thought. Gone, as he threatened, to kill himself, to throw himself under a cart. But no, there he was still sitting alone on the seat, in his shabby overcoat, his legs crossed, staring, talking aloud. Men must not cut down trees. There is a God. 
he noted such revelations on the backs of envelopes. Change the world. No one kills from hatred. Make it known, he wrote it down. He waited. He listened. A sparrow perched on the railing opposite chirped Septimus, Septimus, four or five times over and went on drawing its notes out to sing freshly and piercingly in Greek words how there is no crime and, joined by another sparrow, they sang in voices prolonged and piercing in Greek words from trees in the meadow of life beyond the river where the dead walk how there is no death. There was his hand. There, the dead. White things were assembling behind the railings opposite, but he dared not look. Evans was behind the railings. What are you saying? said Rezia suddenly, sitting down by him. Interrupted again. She was always interrupting. Away from people. They must get away from people, he said, jumping up. Right away over there, where there were chairs beneath a tree and the long slope of the park dipped like a length of green stuff with a ceiling cloth of blue and pink smoke high above, and there was a rampart of far irregular houses hazed in smoke. The traffic hummed in a circle, and on the right dun-coloured animals stretched long necks over the zoo palings, barking, howling. There they sat down under a tree. Look, she implored him, pointing at a little troop of boys carrying cricket stumps, and one shuffled, spun round on his heel and shuffled, as if he were acting a clown at the music hall. Look, she implored him, for Dr. Holmes had told her to make him notice real things, go to a music hall, play cricket. That was the very game, Dr. Holmes said, a nice out-of-door game, the very game for her husband. Look, she repeated. Look, the unseen bade him, the voice which now communicated with him who was the greatest of mankind, Septimus, lately taken from life to death, the Lord who had come to renew society, who lay like a coverlet, a snow blanket smitten only by the sun, forever unwasted, suffering forever, the scapegoat, the eternal sufferer, but he didn't want it, he moaned, putting from him with a wave of his hand that eternal suffering, that eternal loneliness. Look, she repeated, for he must not talk aloud to himself out of doors. Oh, look, she implored him. But what was there to look at? A few sheep, that was all. The way to Regent's Park Tube Station. Could they tell her the way to Regent's Park Tube Station? Maisie Johnson wanted to know. She was only up from Edinburgh two days ago. Not this way, over there, Rezia exclaimed, waving her aside, lest she should see Septimus. Both seemed queer, Maisie Johnson thought. Everything seemed very queer. In London for the first time, come to take up a post at her uncle's in Leadenhall Street, and now walking through Regent's Park in the morning, this couple on the chairs gave her quite a turn. The young woman seeming foreign, the man looking queer. So that should she be very old, she would still remember and make it jangle again among her memories how she had walked through Regent's Park on a fine summer's morning fifty years ago. For she was only nineteen, and had got her way at last, to come to London. And now how queer it was, this couple she had asked the way of. And the girl started and jerked her hand, and the man, he seemed awfully odd. Quarrelling, perhaps. Parting forever, perhaps. Something was up, she knew. And now all these people, for she returned to the broad walk, the stone basins, the prim flowers, the old men and women, invalids, most of them in bath chairs, all seemed, after Edinburgh, so queer. And Maisie Johnson, as she joined that gently trudging, vaguely gazing, breeze-kissed company, squirrels perching and preening, sparrow fountains fluttering for crumbs, 
dogs busy with the railings, busy with each other, while the soft, warm air washed over them and lent to the fixed, unsurprised gaze with which they received life something whimsical and mollified, Maisie Johnson positively felt she must cry, Oh! For that young man on the seat had given her quite a turn. Something was up, she knew. Horror! Horror! she wanted to cry. She had left her people. They had warned her what would happen. Why hadn't she stayed at home? she cried, twisting the knob of the iron railing. That girl, thought Mrs. Dempster, who saved crusts for the squirrels and often ate her lunch in Regent's Park, didn't know a thing yet. And really, it seemed to her better to be a little stout, a little slack, a little moderate in one's expectations. Percy drank, well, better to have a son, thought Mrs. Dempster. She had had a hard time of it and couldn't help smiling at a girl like that. You'll get married, for you're pretty enough, thought Mrs. Dempster. Get married, she thought, and then you'll know. Oh, the cooks, and so on. Every man has his ways. But whether I'd have chosen quite like that if I could have known, thought Mrs. Dempster, and could not help wishing to whisper a word to Maisie Johnson, to feel on the creased pouch of her worn old face the kiss of pity. For it's been a hard life, thought Mrs. Dempster. What hadn't she given to it? Roses, figure... Her feet, too. She drew the knobbed lumps beneath her skirt. Roses, she thought sardonically. All trash, my dear. For really, what with eating, drinking and mating, the bad days and good, life had been no mere matter of roses. And what was more, let me tell you, Carrie Dempster had no wish to change her lot with any woman's in Kentish town. But, she implored, pity, Pity for the loss of roses. Pity, she asked of Maisie Johnson, standing by the hyacinth beds. Ah, but that aeroplane. Hadn't Mrs. Dempster always longed to see foreign parts? She had a nephew, a missionary. It soared and shot. She always went on the sea at Margit. Not out of sight of land, but she had no patience with women who were afraid of water. It swept and fell. Her stomach was in her mouth. Up again. There's a fine young feller aboard of it, Mrs. Dempster wagered. And away and away it went, fast and fading. Away and away the aeroplane shot, soaring over Greenwich and all the masts. Over the little island of grey churches, St. Paul's and the rest, till, on either side of London, fields spread out and dark brown woods where adventurous thrushes hopping boldly glancing quickly snatched the snail and tapped him on a stone once twice thrice away and away the aeroplane shot till it was nothing but a bright spark an aspiration a concentration a symbol so it seemed to Mr. Bentley, vigorously rolling his strip of turf at Greenwich, of man's soul, of his determination, thought Mr. Bentley, sweeping round the cedar tree, to get outside his body, beyond his house, by means of thought, Einstein, speculation, mathematics, the Mendelian theory, away the aeroplane shot. Then... While a seedy-looking, nondescript man carrying a leather bag stood on the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral and hesitated, for within was what balm, how great a welcome, how many tombs with banners waving over them, tokens of victories not over armies but over, he thought, that plaguy spirit of truth-seeking which leaves me at present without a situation, and more than that, the cathedral offers company, he thought invites you to membership of a society. Great men belong to it. Martyrs have died for it. Why not enter in, he thought. Put this leather bag stuffed with pamphlets before an altar, a cross, the symbol of something which has soared beyond seeking and questing and knocking of words together and has become all spirit, disembodied, ghostly. Why not enter in, he thought. And while he hesitated, out flew the aeroplane over Ludgate Circus. It was strange. 
It was still. Not a sound was to be heard above the traffic. Unguided, it seemed, sped of its own free will. And now, curving up and up, straight up, like something mounting in ecstasy, in pure delight, out from behind poured white smoke looping, writing a T, an O, an F. This ends Disc 1. Mrs. Dalloway, Disc 2. What are they looking at? said Clarissa Dalloway to the maid who opened her door. The hall of the house was cool as a vault. Mrs. Dalloway raised her hand to her eyes, and as the maid shut the door to, and she heard the swish of Lucy's skirts, she felt like a nun who has left the world and feels fold round her the familiar veils and the response to old devotions. The cook whistled in the kitchen. She heard the click of the typewriter. It was her life, and bending her head over the hall table, she bowed beneath the influence, felt blessed and purified, saying to herself, as she took the pad with the telephone message on it, how moments like this are buds on the tree of life. Flowers of darkness they are, she thought, as if some lovely rose had blossomed for her eyes only. Not for a moment did she believe in God, but all the more, she thought, taking up the pad, must one repay in daily life to servants, yes, to dogs and canaries, above all to Richard, her husband, who was the foundation of it, of the gay sounds, of the green lights, of the cook, even, whistling, for Mrs. Walker was Irish and whistled all day long. One must pay back from this secret deposit of exquisite moments, she thought, lifting the pad, while Lucy stood by her, trying to explain how. Uh, Mr. Dalloway, ma'am, Clarissa read on the telephone pad, Lady Bruton wishes to know if Mr. Dalloway will lunch with her today. Mr. Dalloway, ma'am, told me to tell you he would be lunching out. Dear, said Clarissa, and Lucy shared, as she meant her to, her disappointment, but not the pang, felt the concord between them, took the hint thought how the gentry love, gilded her own future with calm, and, taking Mrs. Dalloway's parasol, handled it like a sacred weapon which a goddess, having acquitted herself honourably in the field of battle, sheds, and placed it in the umbrella stand. Fear no more, said Clarissa. Fear no more the heat of the sun. For the shock of Lady Bruton asking Richard to lunch without her made the moment in which she had stood shiver, as a plant on the riverbed feels the shock of a passing oar and shivers. So she rocked, so she shivered. Millicent Bruton, whose lunch parties were said to be extraordinarily amusing, had not asked her. No vulgar jealousy could separate her from Richard, but she feared time itself, and read on Lady Bruton's face as if it had been a dial cut in impassive stone, the dwindling of life, how year by year her share was sliced, how little the margin that remained was capable any longer of stretching, of absorbing, as in the youthful years, the colours, salts, tones of existence, so that she filled the room she entered, and felt often as she stood hesitating one moment on the threshold of her drawing-room, an exquisite suspense, such as might stay a diver before plunging, while the sea darkens and brightens beneath him, and the waves which threaten to break, but only gently split their surface, roll and conceal and encrust as they just turn over the weeds with pearl. She put the pad on the hall table, she began to go slowly upstairs, with her hand on the banisters, as if she had left a party where now this friend, now that, had flashed back her face, her voice, had shut the door and gone out and stood alone, a single figure against the appalling night, or rather, to be accurate, against the stare of this matter-of-fact June morning. Soft with the glow of rose petals for some, she knew, and felt it 
as she paused by the open staircase window, which let in blinds flapping, dogs barking. Let in, she thought, feeling herself suddenly shriveled, aged, restless. The grinding, blowing, flowering of the day, out of doors, out of the window, out of her body and brain, which now failed, since Lady Bruton, whose lunch parties were said to be extraordinarily amusing, had not asked her. Like a nun withdrawing, or a child exploring a tower, she went upstairs, paused at the window, came to the bathroom. There was the green linoleum and a tap dripping. There was an emptiness about the heart of life, an attic room. Women must put off their rich apparel. At midday they must disrobe. She pierced the pincushion and laid her feathered yellow hat on the bed. The sheets were clean, tight stretched in a broad white band from side to side. Narrower and narrower would her bed be. The candle was half burnt down, and she had read deep in Baron Marbeau's memoirs. She had read late at night of the retreat from Moscow. For the house sat so long that Richard insisted after her illness that she must sleep undisturbed. And really, she preferred to read of the retreat from Moscow. He knew it. So the room was an attic, the bed narrow. And lying there reading, for she slept badly, she could not dispel a virginity preserved through childbirth which clung to her like a sheet. Lovely in girlhood, suddenly there came a moment, for example on the river beneath the woods at Clevedon, when, through some contraction of this cold spirit, she had failed him. And then at Constantinople, and again and again. She could see what she lacked. It was not beauty, it was not mind. It was something central which permeated, something warm which broke up surfaces and rippled the cold contact of man and woman, or of women together. For that she could dimly perceive, she resented it, had a scruple picked up heaven knows where, or, as she felt, sent by nature, who is invariably wise. Yet she could not resist sometimes yielding to the charm of a woman, not a girl, of a woman confessing, as to her they often did, some scrape, some folly. And whether it was pity, or their beauty, or that she was older, or some accident, like a faint scent, or a violin next door, so strange is the power of sounds at certain moments, she did undoubtedly then feel what men felt, only for a moment, but it was enough. It was a sudden revelation, a tinge like a blush which one tried to check, and then, as it spread, one yielded to its expansion, and rushed to the farthest verge, and there quivered, and felt the world come closer, swollen with some astonishing significance, some pressure of rapture which split its thin skin and gushed and poured with an extraordinary alleviation over the cracks and sores. Then, for that moment, she had seen an illumination, a match burning in a crocus, an inner meaning almost expressed. But the close withdrew, the hard softened. It was over, the moment. Against such moments, with women too, there contrasted, as she laid her hat down, the bed and Baron Marbeau and the candle half burnt. Lying awake, the floor creaked. The lit house was suddenly darkened, and if she raised her head, she could just hear the click of the handle released as gently as possible by Richard who slipped upstairs in his socks, and then, as often as not, dropped his hot water bottle and swore how she laughed. But this question of love, she thought, putting her coat away, this falling in love with women. Take Sally Seaton, her relation in the old days with Sally Seaton. Had not that, after all, been love? She sat on the floor... That was her first impression of Sally. 
She sat on the floor with her arms round her knees, smoking a cigarette. Where could it have been? The Mannings? The Kinlock Joneses? At some party, where she couldn't be certain, for she had a distinct recollection of saying to the man she was with, Who is that? And he had told her, and said that Sally's parents didn't get on. How that shocked her, that one's parents should quarrel. But all that evening, she couldn't take her eyes off Sally. It was an extraordinary beauty of the kind she most admired, dark, large-eyed, with that quality which, since she hadn't got it herself, she always envied, a sort of abandonment, as if she could say anything, do anything, a quality much commoner in foreigners than in English women. Sally always said she had French blood in her veins. An ancestor had been with Marie Antoinette, had his head cut off, left a ruby ring. Perhaps that summer she came to stay at Borton, walking in quite unexpectedly without a penny in her pocket one night after dinner, and upsetting poor Aunt Helena to such an extent that she never forgave her. There had been some quarrel at home. She literally hadn't a penny that night when she came to them, had pawned a brooch to come down. She had rushed off in a passion. They sat up till all hours of the night talking. Sally it was who made her feel, for the first time, how sheltered the life at Borton was. She knew nothing about sex, nothing about social problems. She had once seen an old man who had dropped dead in a field. She had seen cows just after their calves were born, but Aunt Helena never liked discussion of anything. When Sally gave her William Morris, it had to be wrapped in brown paper. There they sat, hour after hour, talking in her bedroom at the top of the house, talking about life, how they were to reform the world. They meant to found a society to abolish private property, and actually had a letter written, though not sent out. The ideas were Sally's, of course, but very soon she was just as excited, read Plato in bed before breakfast, read Morris, read Shelley by the hour. Sally's power was amazing, her gift, her personality. There was her way with flowers, for instance. At Borton, they always had stiff little vases all the way down the table. Sally went out, picked hollyhocks, dahlias, all sorts of flowers that had never been seen together, cut their heads off and made them swim on the top of water in bowls. The effect was extraordinary, coming in to dinner in the sunset. Of course, Aunt Helena thought it wicked to treat flowers like that. Then she forgot her sponge and ran along the passage naked. That grim old housemaid, Ellen Atkins, went about grumbling, suppose any of the gentlemen had seen. Indeed, she did shock people. She was untidy, Papa said. The strange thing, on looking back, was the purity, the integrity of her feeling for Sally. It wasn't like one's feeling for a man. It was completely disinterested. And besides, it had a quality which could only exist between women, between women just grown up. It was protective on her side, sprang from a sense of being in league together, a presentiment of something that was bound to part them. They spoke of marriage always as a catastrophe, which led to this chivalry, this protective feeling, which was much more on her side than Sally's. For in those days she was completely reckless, did the most idiotic things out of bravado, bicycled round the parapet on the terrace, smoked cigars. Absurd, she was, very absurd. But the charm was overpowering, to her at least, so that she could remember standing in her bedroom at the top of the house, holding the hot water can in her hands and saying aloud, she is beneath this roof. She is beneath this roof. No, the words meant absolutely nothing to her now. She couldn't even get an echo of her old emotion. But she could remember going cold with excitement and doing her hair in a kind of ecstasy. Now the old feeling began to come back to her, 
as she took out her hairpins, laid them on the dressing table, began to do her hair. With the rooks flaunting up and down in the pink evening light, and dressing, and going downstairs, and feeling as she crossed the hall, if it were now to die, twere now to be most happy. That was her feeling, Othello's feeling, and she felt it, she was convinced, as strongly as Shakespeare meant Othello to feel it, all because she was coming down to dinner in a white frock to meet Sally Seaton. She was wearing pink gauze. Was that possible? She seemed, anyhow, all light, glowing, like some bird or air ball that has flown in, attached itself for a moment to a bramble. But nothing is so strange when one is in love, and what was this except being in love, as the complete indifference of other people. Aunt Helena just wandered off after dinner. Papa read the paper. Peter Walsh might have been there, and old Miss Cummings. Joseph Brightcoff certainly was, for he came every summer, poor old man, for weeks and weeks, and pretended to read German with her, but really played the piano and sang Brahms without any voice. All this was only a background for Sally. She stood by the fireplace, talking in that beautiful voice which made everything she said sound like a caress, to Papa, who had begun to be attracted rather against his will. He never got over lending her one of his books and finding it soaked on the terrace, when suddenly she said, What a shame to sit indoors! And they all went out onto the terrace and walked up and down. Peter Walsh and Joseph Brightcott went on about Wagner, she and Sally fell a little behind. Then came the most exquisite moment of her whole life, passing a stone urn with flowers in it. Sally stopped, picked a flower, kissed her on the lips. The whole world might have turned upside down. The others disappeared. There she was, alone with Sally, and she felt that she had been given a present, wrapped up and told just to keep it not to look at it, a diamond, something infinitely precious, wrapped up, which, as they walked up and down, up and down, she uncovered, or the radiance burnt through, the revelation, the religious feeling, when old Joseph and Peter faced them. Stargazing, said Peter. It was like running one's face against a granite wall in the darkness. It was shocking. It was horrible. Not for herself. She felt only how Sally was being mauled already, maltreated. She felt his hostility, his jealousy, his determination to break into their companionship. All this she saw as one sees a landscape in a flash of lightning. And Sally, never had she admired her so much, gallantly taking her way unvanquished. She laughed. She made old Joseph tell her the names of the stars, which she liked doing very seriously. She stood there. She listened. She heard the names of the stars. Oh, this horror, she said to herself, as if she had known all along that something would interrupt, would embitter her moment of happiness. Yet, after all, how much she owed to him later. Always when she thought of him, she thought of their quarrels for some reason, because she wanted his good opinion so much, perhaps. She owed him words, sentimental, civilised. They started up every day of her life as if he guarded her. A book was sentimental, an attitude to life sentimental. Sentimental, perhaps, she was to be thinking of the past. What would he think, she wondered, when he came back? That she had grown older? Would he say that, or would she see him thinking when he came back that she had grown older? It was true. Since her illness, she had turned almost white. Laying her brooch on the table, she had a sudden spasm, as if, while she mused, the icy claws had had the chance to fix in her. She was not old yet. She had just broken into her fifty-second year. Months and months of it were still untouched. June, July, August, 
each still remained almost whole, and as if to catch the falling drop, Clarissa, crossing to the dressing table, plunged into the very heart of the moment, transfixed it. There, the moment of this June morning on which was the pressure of all the other mornings, seeing the glass, the dressing table, and all the bottles afresh, collecting the whole of her at one point as she looked into the glass, seeing the delicate pink face of the woman who was that very night to give a party, of Carissa Dalloway, of herself. How many million times she had seen her face, and always with the same imperceptible contraction. She pursed her lips when she looked in the glass. It was to give her face point. That was herself, pointed, dark-like, definite. That was herself, when some effort, some call on her to be herself, drew the parts together, she alone knew how different, how incompatible and composed so for the world only, into one centre, one diamond, one woman who sat in her drawing room and made a meeting point, a radiancy, no doubt, in some dull lives, a refuge for the lonely to come to, perhaps. She had helped young people who were grateful to her, had tried to be the same always, never showing a sign of all the other sides of her, faults, jealousies, vanities, suspicions, like this of Lady Bruton not asking her to lunch, which, she thought, combing her hair finally, is utterly base. Now, where was her dress? Her evening dresses hung in the cupboard. Clarissa, plunging her hand into the softness, gently detached the green dress and carried it to the window. She had torn it. Someone had trod on the skirt. She'd felt it give at the embassy party, at the top among the folds. By artificial light, the green shone, but lost its colour now in the sun. She would mend it. Her maids had too much to do. She would wear it tonight. She would take her silks, her scissors, her what was it? Her thimble, of course, down into the drawing room, for she must also write and see that things generally were more or less in order. Strange, she thought, pausing on the landing and assembling that diamond shape, that single person. Strange how a mistress knows the very moment, the very temper of her house. Faint sounds rose in spirals up the well of the stairs, the swish of a mop, tapping, knocking, a loudness when the front door opened, a voice repeating a message in the basement, the chink of silver on a tray, clean silver for the party. All was for the party. And Lucy, coming into the drawing room with her tray held out, put the giant candlesticks on the mantelpiece, the silver casket in the middle, turned the crystal dolphin towards the clock. They would come, they would stand, they would talk in the mincing tones which she could imitate, ladies and gentlemen. Of all, her mistress was loveliest, mistress of silver, of linen, of china. For the sun, the silver, doors off her hinges, Rumpelmeyer's men, gave her a sense, as she laid the paper knife on the inlaid table, of something achieved. Behold, behold, she said, speaking to her old friends in the baker's shop, where she had first seen service at Caterham, prying into the glass. She was Lady Angela, attending Princess Mary, when in came Mrs. Dalloway. Oh, Lucy, she said, the silver does look nice. And how, she said, turning the crystal dolphin to stand straight, how did you enjoy the play last night? Oh, they had to go before the end, she said. They had to be back at ten, she said. So they don't know what happened, she said. That does seem hard luck, she said, for her servants stayed later if they asked her. That does seem rather a shame, she said, taking the old bald-looking cushion in the middle of the sofa and putting it in Lucy's arms and giving her a little push and crying, Take it away. Give it to Mrs. Walker with my compliments. Take it away, she cried. And Lucy stopped at the drawing-room door, holding the cushion, and said, very shyly, turning a little pink, couldn't she help to mend that dress? 
But, said Mrs. Dalloway, she had enough on her hands already, quite enough of her own to do without that. But thank you, Lucy, oh, thank you, said Mrs. Dalloway. And thank you, thank you, she went on saying, sitting down on the sofa with her dress over her knees, her scissors, her silks. Thank you, thank you, she went on saying in gratitude to her servants generally, for helping her to be like this, to be what she wanted, gentle, generous-hearted. Her servants liked her. And then this dress of hers, where was the tear? And now her needle to be threaded. This was a favourite dress, one of Sally Parker's, the last almost she ever made, alas, for Sally had now retired, living at Ealing. And if ever I have a moment, thought Clarissa, but never would she have a moment any more, I shall go and see her at Ealing. For she was a character, thought Clarissa, a real artist. She thought of little out-of-the-way things, yet her dresses were never queer. You could wear them at Hatfield, at Buckingham Palace. She had worn them at Hatfield, at Buckingham Palace. Quiet descended on her, calm, content, as her needle, drawing the silk smoothly to its gentle paws, collected the green folds together and attached them very lightly to the belt. So on a summer's day, waves collect, overbalance and fall, collect and fall. And the whole world seems to be saying, that is all, more and more ponderously, until even the heart in the body which lies in the sun on the beach says too, that is all. Fear no more, says the heart. Fear no more, says the heart, committing its burden to some sea which sighs collectively for all sorrows and renews, begins, collects, lets fall. And the body alone listens to the passing bee, the wave breaking, the dog barking, far away barking and barking. Heavens, the front doorbell, exclaimed Clarissa, staying her needle. Roused, she listened. Mrs. Dalloway will see me, said the elderly man in the hall. Oh, yes, she will see me, he repeated, putting Lucy aside very benevolently and running upstairs ever so quickly. Yes, 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 he muttered as he ran upstairs. She will see me. After five years in India, Clarissa will see me. Who can, what can, asked Mrs. Dalloway, thinking it was outrageous to be interrupted at eleven o'clock on the morning of the day she was giving a party, hearing a step on the stairs. She heard a hand upon the door. She made to hide her dress like a virgin protecting chastity, respecting privacy. Now the brass knob slipped. Now the door opened. And in came... For a single second, she couldn't remember what he was called. So surprised she was to see him. So glad. So shy. So utterly taken aback to have Peter Walsh come to her unexpectedly in the morning. She had not read his letter. And how are you? said Peter Walsh, positively trembling, taking both her hands, kissing both her hands. She's grown older, he thought, sitting down. I shan't tell her anything about it, he thought, for she's grown older. She's looking at me, he thought, a sudden embarrassment coming over him, though he had kissed her hands. Putting his hand into his pocket, he took out a large pocket knife and half opened the blade. Exactly the same, thought Clarissa. The same queer look, the same check suit. A little out of the straight his face is, a little thinner, drier perhaps, but he looks awfully well and just the same. How heavenly it is to see you again, she exclaimed. He had his knife out. That's so like him, she thought. He had only reached town last night, he said. Would have to go down into the country at once. And how was everything? How was everybody? Richard? Elizabeth? And what's all this? he said, tilting his penknife towards her green dress. He's very well dressed, thought Clarissa. 
yet he always criticises me. Here she is, mending her dress. Mending her dress as usual, he thought. Here she's been sitting all the time I've been in India, mending her dress, playing about, going to parties, running to the house and back, and all that, he thought, growing more and more irritated, more and more agitated. For there's nothing in the world so bad for some women as marriage, he thought, and politics, and having a conservative husband like the admirable Richard. So it is, so it is, he thought, shutting his knife with a snap. Richard's very well. Richard's at a committee, said Clarissa. And she opened her scissors and said, did he mind her just finishing what she was doing to her dress, for they had a party that night. Which I shan't ask you to, she said. My dear Peter, she said. But it was delicious to hear her say that. My dear Peter. Indeed, it was all so delicious. The silver, the chairs, all so delicious. Why wouldn't she ask him to her party, he asked. Now, of course, thought Clarissa, he's enchanting, perfectly enchanting. Now I remember how impossible it was ever to make up my mind, and why did I make up my mind not to marry him, she wondered, that awful summer. But it's so extraordinary that you should have come this morning, she cried, putting her hands one on top of another down on her dress. Do you remember, she said, how the blinds used to flap at Borton? They did, he said. And he remembered breakfasting alone, very awkwardly, with her father, who had died, and he'd not written to Clarissa. But he had never got on well with old Parry, that querulous, weak-kneed old man, Clarissa's father, Justin Parry. I often wish I'd got on better with your father, he said. But he never liked anyone who, ah, friends, said Clarissa, and could have bitten her tongue for thus reminding Peter that he had wanted to marry her. Of course I did, thought Peter. It almost broke my heart, too, he thought, and was overcome with his own grief, which rose like a moon looked at from a terrace, ghastly beautiful with light from the sunken day. I was more unhappy than I've ever been since, he thought. And as if, in truth, he were sitting there on the terrace, he edged a little towards Clarissa, put his hand out, raised it, let it fall. There above them it hung, that moon. She too seemed to be sitting with him on the terrace in the moonlight. Herbert has it now, she said. I never go there now, she said. Then, just as happens on a terrace in the moonlight, when one person begins to feel ashamed that he is already bored, and yet, as the other sits silent, very quiet, sadly looking at the moon, does not like to speak, moves his foot, clears his throat, notices some iron scroll on a table leg, stirs the leaf, but says nothing. So Peter Walsh did now. For why go back like this to the past, he thought. Why make him think of it again? Why make him suffer? when she had tortured him so infernally. Why? Do you remember the lake, she said, in an abrupt voice, under the pressure of an emotion which caught her heart, made the muscles of her throat stiff, and contracted her lips in a spasm as she said, lake. For she was a child, throwing bread to the ducks between her parents, and at the same time a grown woman coming to her parents who stood by the lake, holding her life in her arms, which, as she neared them, grew larger and larger in her arms, until it became a whole life, a complete life, which she put down by them and said, This is what I have made of it, this. And what had she made of it? What, indeed, sitting there sewing this morning with Peter? She looked at Peter Walsh. Her look passing through all that time and that emotion, reached him doubtfully, settled on him tearfully, and rose and fluttered away as a bird touches a branch and rises and flutters away. Quite simply, she wiped her eyes. 
Yes, said Peter. Yes, 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 he said, as if she drew up to the surface something which positively hurt him as it rose. Stop, stop, he wanted to cry, for he was not old, his life was not over, not by any means. He was only just past fifty. Shall I tell her, he thought, or not? He would like to make a clean breast of it all, but she is too cold, he thought, sewing with her scissors. Daisy would look ordinary beside Clarissa, and she would think me a failure, which I am in their sense, he thought, in the Dalloway's sense. Oh, yes, he had no doubt about that. He was a failure compared with all this, the inlaid table, the mounted paper knife, the dolphin and the candlesticks, the chair covers and the old valuable English tinted prints. He was a failure. I detest the smugness of the whole affair, he thought. Richard's doing, not Clarissa's, save that she married him. Here Lucy came into the room, carrying silver, more silver, but charming, slender, graceful she looked, he thought, as she stooped to put it down. And this has been going on all the time, he thought, week after week, Clarissa's life, while I, he thought, and at once everything seemed to radiate from him, journeys, rides, quarrels, adventures, bridge parties, love affairs, work, 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 and he took out his knife quite openly, his old horn-handled knife, which Clarissa could swear he had had these thirty years, and clenched his fist upon it. What an extraordinary habit that was, Clarissa thought, always playing with a knife, always making one feel, too, frivolous, empty-minded, a mere silly chatterbox, as he used. But I, too, she thought, and, taking up her needle, summoned like a queen whose guards have fallen asleep and left her unprotected. She had been quite taken aback by this visit. It had upset her, so that anyone can stroll in and have a look at her where she lies with the brambles curving over her. Summoned to her help the things she did, the things she liked, her husband, Elizabeth, herself, in short, which Peter hardly knew now, all to come about her and beat off the enemy. Well, and what's happened to you, she said. So, before a battle begins, the horses paw the ground, toss their heads, the light shines on their flanks, their necks curve. So Peter Walsh and Clarissa, sitting side by side on the blue sofa, challenged each other. His powers chafed and tossed in him. He assembled from different quarters all sorts of things. Praise, his career at Oxford, his marriage, which she knew nothing whatever about, how he had loved and altogether done his job. Millions of things, he exclaimed, and urged by the assembly of powers, which were now charging this way and that, and giving him the feeling at once frightening and extremely exhilarating of being rushed through the air on the shoulders of people he could no longer see, he raised his hands to his forehead. Clarissa sat very upright, drew in her breath. I am in love, he said. Not to her, however, but to someone raised up in the dark so that you could not touch her, but must lay your garland down on the grass in the dark. In love, he repeated, now speaking rather dryly to Clarissa Dalloway, in love with a girl in India. He had deposited his garland. Clarissa could make what she would of it. In love, she said, that he at his age should be sucked under in his little bow tie by that monster. And there's no flesh on his neck. His hands are red. And he's six months older than I am. Her eye flashed back to her. But in her heart she felt all the same. He is in love. He has that, she felt. He is in love. But the indomitable egotism which forever rides down the hosts opposed to it, the river which says on, 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 even though it admits there may be no goal for us whatever, 
still on, on. This indomitable egotism charged her cheeks with colour, made her look very young, very pink, very bright-eyed as she sat with her dress upon her knee and her needle held to the end of green silk, trembling a little. He was in love, not with her, with some younger woman, of course. And who is she? she asked. Now this statue must be brought from its height and set down between them. A married woman, unfortunately, he said, the wife of a major in the Indian army. And with a curious ironical sweetness, he smiled as he placed her in this ridiculous way before Clarissa. All the same, he is in love, thought Clarissa. She has, he continued very reasonably, two small children, a boy and a girl, and I have come over to see my lawyers about the divorce. There they are, he thought. Do what you like with them, Clarissa. There they are. And second by second, it seemed to him that the wife of the major in the Indian army, his Daisy, and her two small children, became more and more lovely as Clarissa looked at them, as if he had set light to a grey pellet on a plate, and there had risen up a lovely tree in the brisk sea-salted air of their intimacy, for in some ways no one understood him, felt with him, as Clarissa did, their exquisite intimacy. She flattered him. She fooled him, thought Clarissa, shaping the woman, the wife of the major in the Indian army, with three strokes of a knife. What a waste! What a folly! All his lifelong Peter had been fooled like that. First getting sent down from Oxford, next marrying the girl on the boat going out to India, now the wife of a major in the Indian army. Thank heaven she had refused to marry him. Still, he was in love. Her old friend, her dear Peter, he was in love. But what are you going to do? she asked him. Oh, the lawyers and solicitors, Messrs. Hooper and Greatly of Lincoln's Inn, they were going to do it, he said. And he actually pared his nails with his pocket knife. For heaven's sake, leave your knife alone, she cried to herself in irrepressible irritation. It was his silly unconventionality, his weakness, his lack of the ghost of a notion what anyone else was feeling that annoyed her, had always annoyed her. And now at his age, how silly. I know all that, Peter thought. I know what I'm up against, he thought, running his finger along the blade of his knife. Clarissa and Dalloway and all the rest of them. But I'll show Clarissa. And then to his utter surprise, Suddenly thrown by those uncontrollable forces thrown through the air, he burst into tears. Wept, wept without the least shame, sitting on the sofa, the tears running down his cheeks. And Clarissa had leant forward, taken his hand, drawn him to her, kissed him, actually had felt his face on hers before she could down the brandishing of silver flashing, plumes like pampas grass in a tropic gale in her breast, which, subsiding, left her holding his hand, patting his knee, and feeling, as she sat back, extraordinarily at her ease with him and light-hearted. All in a clap it came over her. If I had married him, this gaiety would have been mine all day. It was all over for her. The sheet was stretched and the bed narrow. She had gone up into the tower alone and left them blackberrying in the sun. The door had shut, and there among the dust of fallen plaster and the litter of birds' nests, how distant the view had looked, and the sounds came thin and chill. Once on Leith Hill, she remembered. And Richard, Richard, she cried, as a sleeper in the night starts and stretches a hand in the dark for help. Lunching with Lady Bruton, it came back to her. He has left me. I am alone forever, she thought, folding her hands upon her knee. 
Peter Walsh had got up and crossed to the window and stood with his back to her, flicking a bandana handkerchief from side to side. Masterly and dry and desolate he looked, his thin shoulder blades lifting his coat slightly, blowing his nose violently. Take me with you, Clarissa thought impulsively, as if he were starting directly upon some great voyage. And then, next moment, it was as if the five acts of a play that had been very exciting and moving were now over, and she had lived a lifetime in them, and had run away, had lived with Peter, and it was now over. Now it was time to move, and as a woman gathers her things together, her cloak, her gloves, her opera glasses, and gets up to go out of the theatre into the street, she rose from the sofa and went to Peter. And it was awfully strange, he thought, how she still had the power as she came tinkling, rustling, still had the power as she came across the room to make the moon, which he detested, rise at Borton on the terrace in the summer sky. Tell me, he said, seizing her by the shoulders, are you happy, Clarissa? Does Richard... The door opened. Here is my Elizabeth, said Clarissa emotionally, histrionically, perhaps. How do you do? said Elizabeth, coming forward. The sound of Big Ben striking the half hour stuck out between them with extraordinary vigour, as if a young man, strong, indifferent, inconsiderate, were swinging dumbbells this way and that. Hello, Elizabeth, cried Peter, stuffing his handkerchief into his pocket, going quickly to her, saying, Goodbye, Clarissa, without looking at her, leaving the room quickly and running downstairs and opening the hall door. Peter, Peter, cried Clarissa, following him out onto the landing. My party tonight, remember my party tonight, she cried, having to raise her voice against the roar of the open air and, overwhelmed by the traffic and the sound of all the clocks striking, her voice crying, Remember my party tonight, sounded frail and thin and very far away as Peter Walsh shut the door. Remember my party, remember my party, said Peter Walsh as he stepped down the street, speaking to himself rhythmically in time with the flow of the sound, the direct downright sound of Big Ben striking the half hour. The leaden circles dissolved in the air. Oh, these parties, he thought, Clarissa's parties. Why did she give these parties, he thought. Not that he blamed her, or this effigy of a man in a tailcoat with a carnation in his buttonhole coming towards him. Only one person in the world could be as he was, in love. And there he was, this fortunate man, himself, reflected in the plate-glass window of a motor-car manufacturer in Victoria Street. All India lay behind him. Plains, mountains, epidemics of cholera, a district twice as big as Ireland, decisions he had come to alone, he, Peter Walsh who was now really, for the first time in his life, in love. Clarissa had grown hard, he thought, and a trifle sentimental into the bargain, he suspected, looking at the great motor cars capable of doing how many miles on how many gallons, for he had a turn for mechanics, had invented a plough in his district, had ordered wheelbarrows from England, but the coolies wouldn't use them, all of which Clarissa knew nothing whatever about. The way she said, here is my Elizabeth, that annoyed him. Why not, here's Elizabeth, simply? It was insincere, and Elizabeth didn't like it either. Still the last tremors of the great booming voice shook the air round him. The half hour, still early, only half past eleven still. For he understood young people, he liked them. There was always something cold in Clarissa, he thought. She had always, even as a girl, a sort of timidity, which in middle age becomes conventionality. And then it's all up. It's all up, he thought, looking rather drearily into the glassy depths 
and wondering whether by calling at that hour he had annoyed her. Overcome with shame suddenly at having been a fool, wept, been emotional, told her everything, as usual, as usual. As a cloud crosses the sun, silence falls on London and falls on the mind. Effort ceases. Time flaps on the mast. There we stop. There we stand. Rigid, the skeleton of habit alone upholds the human frame. Where there is nothing, Peter Walsh said to himself, feeling hollowed out, utterly empty within. Clarissa refused me, he thought. He stood there thinking, Clarissa refused me. Ah, said St. Margaret's, like a hostess who comes into her drawing room on the very stroke of the hour and finds her guests there already. I am not late. No, it is precisely half past eleven, she says. Yet, though she is perfectly right, her voice, being the voice of the hostess, is reluctant to inflict its individuality. Some grief for the past holds it back, some concern for the present. It is half past eleven, she says, and the sound of St. Margaret's glides into the recesses of the heart and buries itself in ring after ring of sound, like something alive which wants to confide itself, to disperse itself, to be, with a tremor of delight, at rest. Like Clarissa herself, thought Peter Walsh, coming down the stairs on the stroke of the hour in white. It is Clarissa herself, he thought, with a deep emotion, and an extraordinarily clear yet puzzling recollection of her. As if this bell had come into the room years ago, where they sat at some moment of great intimacy, and had gone from one to the other, and had left, like a bee with honey, laden with the moment. But what room? What moment? And why had he been so profoundly happy when the clock was striking? Then, as the sound of St. Margaret's languished, he thought, she's been ill, and the sound expressed languor and suffering. It was her heart, he remembered, and the sudden loudness of the final stroke told for death that surprised in the midst of life, Clarissa falling where she stood in her drawing room. No, no, he cried, she's not dead. I am not old, he cried, and marched up Whitehall as if there rolled down to him, vigorous, unending, his future. He was not old, or set, or dried in the least. As for caring what they said of him, the Dalloways, the Whitbreads and their set, he cared not a straw. Though it was true he would have some time or other to see whether Richard couldn't help him to some job. Striding, staring, he glared at the statue of the Duke of Cambridge. He had been sent down from Oxford. True. He had been a socialist, in some sense a failure. True. Still, the future of civilization lies, he thought, in the hands of young men like that. Of young men such as he was thirty years ago, with their love of abstract principles, getting books sent out to them all the way from London to a peak in the Himalayas, reading science, reading philosophy. The future lies in the hands of young men like that, he thought. A patter like the patter of leaves in a wood came from behind, and with it a rustling, regular thudding sound, which, as it overtook him, drummed his thoughts, strict in step, up Whitehall without his doing. Boys in uniform, carrying guns, marched with their eyes ahead of them, marched, their arms stiff, and on their faces an expression like the letters of a legend written round the base of a statue, praising duty, gratitude, fidelity, love of England. It is, thought Peter Walsh, beginning to keep step with them, a very fine training. But they didn't look robust, they were weedy for the most part, boys of sixteen who might tomorrow stand behind bowls of rice, cakes of soap on counters. 
Now they wore on them, unmixed with sensual pleasure or daily preoccupations, the solemnity of the wreath which they had fetched from Finsbury pavement to the empty tomb. They had taken their vow. The traffic respected it. Vans were stopped. I can't keep up with them, Peter Walsh thought, as they marched up Whitehall. And sure enough, on they marched, past him, past everyone, in their steady way, as if one will worked legs and arms uniformly, and life, with its varieties, its irreticences, had been laid under a pavement of monuments and wreaths and drugged into a stiff yet staring corpse by discipline. One had to respect it. One might laugh, but one had to respect it, he thought. There they go, thought Peter Walsh, pausing at the edge of the pavement, and all the exalted statues, Nelson, Gordon, Havelock, the black, the spectacular images of great soldiers, stood looking ahead of them, as if they too had made the same renunciation. Peter Walsh felt he too had made it, the great renunciation, trampled under the same temptations, and achieved at length a marble stare. But the stare Peter Walsh did not want for himself in the least, though he could respect it in others. He could respect it in boys. They don't know the troubles of the flesh yet, he thought, as the marching boys disappeared in the direction of the Strand. All that I've been through, he thought, crossing the road and standing under Gordon's statue. Gordon, whom as a boy he had worshipped. Gordon standing lonely with one leg raised and his arms crossed. Poor Gordon, he thought. And just because nobody yet knew he was in London, except Clarissa, and the earth, after the voyage, still seemed an island to him, the strangeness of standing alone, alive, unknown, at half-past eleven in Trafalgar Square, overcame him. What is it? Where am I? And why, after all, does one do it, he thought, the divorce seeming all moonshine. And down his mind went, flat as a marsh, and three great emotions bowled over him. Understanding, a vast philanthropy, and finally, as if the result of the others, an irrepressible, exquisite delight. As if inside his brain, by another hand, strings were pulled, shutters moved, and he, having nothing to do with it, yet stood at the opening of endless avenues down which, if he chose, he might wander. He hadn't felt so young for years. He had escaped, was utterly free, as happens in the downfall of habit, when the mind, like an unguarded flame, bows and bends and seems about to blow from its holding. I haven't felt so young for years, thought Peter, escaping only, of course, for an hour or so, from being precisely what he was, and feeling like a child who runs out of doors and sees, as he runs, his old nurse waving at the wrong window. But she is extraordinarily attractive, he thought, as, walking across Trafalgar Square in the direction of the Haymarket, came a young woman who, as she passed Gordon's statue, seemed, Peter Walsh thought, susceptible as he was, to shed veil after veil until she became the very woman he had always had in mind. Young, but stately. Merry, but discreet. Black, but enchanting. Straightening himself and stealthily fingering his pocket knife, he started after her to follow this woman, this excitement, which seemed, even with its back turned, to shed on him a light which connected them, which singled him out, as if the random uproar of the traffic had whispered through hollowed hands his name. Not Peter, but his private name, which he called himself in his own thoughts. You, she said, only you, saying it with her white gloves and her shoulders. Then, the thin long cloak which the wind stirred as she walked past Dent's shop in Cockspur Street blew out with an enveloping kindness, a mournful tenderness, as of arms that would open and take the tired. 
but she's not married. She's young, quite young, thought Peter. The red carnation he had seen her wear as she came across Trafalgar Square, burning again in his eyes and making her lips red. But she waited at the curbstone. There was a dignity about her. She was not worldly, like Clarissa, not rich, like Clarissa. Was she, he wondered as she moved, respectable? Witty, with a lizard's flickering tongue, he thought, for one must invent, one must allow oneself a little diversion. A cool, waiting wit, a darting wit, not noisy. She moved, she crossed, he followed her. To embarrass her was the last thing he wished. Still, if she stopped, he would say, Come and have an ice, he would say, and she would answer perfectly simply, Oh, yes. But other people got between them in the street, obstructing him, blotting her out. He pursued. She changed. There was colour in her cheeks, mockery in her eyes. He was an adventurer, reckless, he thought, swift, daring. Indeed, landed as he was last night from India, a romantic buccaneer, careless of all these damn proprieties, yellow dressing gowns, pipes, fishing rods in the shop windows, and respectability and evening parties and spruce old men wearing white slips beneath their waistcoats. He was a buccaneer. On and on she went, across Piccadilly and up Regent Street, ahead of him, her cloak, her gloves, her shoulders, combining with the fringes and the laces and the feather boas in the windows to make the spirit of finery and whimsy which dwindled out of the shops onto the pavement as the light of a lamp goes wavering at night over hedges in the darkness. Laughing and delightful, she had crossed Oxford Street and Great Portland Street and turned down one of the little streets, and now, and now, the great moment was approaching, for now she slackened, opened her bag, and with one look in his direction, but not at him, one look that bade farewell, summed up the whole situation and dismissed it triumphantly, forever, had fitted her key, opened the door, and gone. Clarissa's voice saying, Remember my party, remember my party, sang in his ears. The house was one of those flat red houses with hanging flower baskets of vague impropriety, it was over. Well, I've had my fun. I've had it, he thought, looking up at the swinging baskets of pale geraniums. And it was smashed to atoms. His fun, for it was half made up, as he knew very well, invented this escapade with the girl. Made up as one makes up the better part of life, he thought. Making oneself up, making her up, creating an exquisite amusement and something more. But odd it was, and quite true. All this one could never share. It smashed to atoms. He turned, went up the street, thinking to find somewhere to sit, till it was time for Lincoln's Inn, for Messrs. Hooper and Greatly. Where should he go? No matter. Up the street, then, towards Regent's Park. His boots on the pavement struck out, no matter, for it was early, still very early. It was a splendid morning, too. Like the pulse of a perfect heart, life struck straight through the streets. There was no fumbling, no hesitation. Sweeping and swerving, accurately, punctually, noiselessly, there, precisely at the right instant, the motor-car stopped at the door. The girl, silk-stockinged, feathered, evanescent, but not to him particularly attractive, for he had had his fling, alighted. Admirable butlers, tawny chow-dogs, halls laid in black and white lozenges with white blinds blowing, Peter saw through the opened door and approved of. A splendid achievement in its own way, after all, London the season, civilization. Coming as he did from a respectable Anglo-Indian family, which for at least three generations had administered the affairs of a continent, 
It's strange, he thought, what a sentiment I have about that, disliking India and empire and army as he did. There were moments when civilization, even of this sort, seemed dear to him as a personal possession. Moments of pride in England, in butlers, chow dogs, girls in their security. Ridiculous enough, still, there it is, he thought. And the doctors and men of business and capable women all going about their business, punctual, alert, robust, seemed to him wholly admirable, good fellows to whom one would entrust one's life, companions in the art of living, who would see one through. What with one thing and another, the show was really very tolerable, and he would sit down in the shade and smoke. There was Regent's Park, yes. As a child, he had walked in Regent's Park. Odd, he thought, how the thought of childhood keeps coming back to me. The result of seeing Clarissa, perhaps, for women live much more in the past than we do, he thought. They attach themselves to places and their fathers. A woman's always proud of her father. Borton was a nice place, a very nice place, but I could never get on with the old man, he thought. There was quite a scene one night, an argument about something or other, what he couldn't remember. Politics, presumably. Yes, he remembered Regent's Park. The long, straight walk. The little house where one bought air balls to the left. An absurd statue with an inscription somewhere or other. He looked for an empty seat. He didn't want to be bothered feeling a little drowsy as he did, by people asking him the time. An elderly grey nurse with a baby asleep in its perambulator, that was the best he could do for himself, sit down at the far end of the seat by that nurse. She's a queer-looking girl, he thought, suddenly remembering Elizabeth as she came into the room and stood by her mother. Grown big, quite grown up, not exactly pretty, handsome, rather, and she can't be more than 18. Probably she doesn't get on with Clarissa. There's my Elizabeth, that sort of thing. Why not here's Elizabeth, simply, trying to make out, like most mothers, that things are what they're not. She trusts to her charm too much, he thought. She overdoes it. The rich, benignant cigar smoke eddied coolly down his throat. He puffed it out again in rings which breasted the air bravely for a moment. Blue, circular. I shall try and get a word alone with Elizabeth tonight, he thought. Then began to wobble into hourglass shapes and taper away. Odd shapes they take, he thought. Suddenly he closed his eyes, raised his hand with an effort, and threw away the heavy end of his cigar. A great brush swept smooth across his mind, Sweeping across it, moving branches, children's voices, the shuffle of feet, and people passing and humming traffic, rising and falling traffic. Down, down he sank into the plumes and feathers of sleep, sank and was muffled over. This ends Disc 2, Mrs. Dalloway, Disc 3. The grey nurse resumed her knitting as Peter Walsh, on the hot seat beside her, began snoring. In her grey dress, moving her hands indefatigably yet quietly, she seemed like the champion of the rights of sleepers, like one of those spectral presences which rise in twilight in woods made of sky and branches. The solitary traveller, haunter of lanes, disturber of ferns, and devastator of great hemlock plants, looking up, suddenly sees the giant figure at the end of the ride. By conviction an atheist, perhaps, he is taken by surprise with moments of extraordinary exaltation. Nothing exists outside us except a state of mind, he thinks, a desire for solace, for relief, for something outside these miserable pygmies, these feeble, these ugly, these craven men and women. But if he can conceive of her, then in some sort she exists, he thinks, 
and advancing down the path, with his eyes upon sky and branches, he rapidly endows them with womanhood, sees with amazement how grave they become, how majestically, as the breeze stirs them, they dispense with a dark flutter of the leaves, charity, comprehension, absolution, and then, flinging themselves suddenly aloft, confound the piety of their aspect with a wild carouse. Such are the visions which proffer great cornucopias full of fruit to the solitary traveller, or murmur in his ear like sirens lolloping away on the green sea waves, or are dashed in his face like bunches of roses, or rise to the surface like pale faces which fishermen flounder through floods to embrace. Such are the visions which ceaselessly float up, pace beside, put their faces in front of the actual thing, often overpowering the solitary traveller and taking away from him the sense of the earth, the wish to return, and giving him for substitute a general peace, as if, so he thinks as he advances down the forest ride, all this fever of living were simplicity itself, and myriads of things merged in one thing, and this figure, made of sky and branches as it is, had risen from the troubled sea, he is elderly, past fifty now, as a shape might be sucked up out of the waves to shower down from her magnificent hands compassion, comprehension, absolution. So, he thinks, may I never go back to the lamplight, to the sitting room, never finish my book, never knock out my pipe, Never ring for Mrs. Turner to clear away. Rather, let me walk straight on to this great figure, who will, with a toss of her head, mount me on her streamers and let me blow to nothingness with the rest. Such are the visions. The solitary traveller is soon beyond the wood. And there, coming to the door with shaded eyes, possibly to look for his return, with hands raised, with white apron blowing, is an elderly woman who seems, so powerful is this infirmity, to seek over a desert a lost son, to search for a rider destroyed, to be the figure of the mother whose sons have been killed in the battles of the world. So, as the solitary traveller advances down the village street, where the women stand knitting and the men dig in the garden, the evening seems ominous, the figures still, as if some august fate known to them, awaited without fear, were about to sweep them into complete annihilation. Indoors among ordinary things, the cupboard, the table, the windowsill with its geraniums, suddenly the outline of the landlady, bending to remove the cloth, becomes soft with light, an adorable emblem which only the recollection of cold human contacts forbids us to embrace. She takes the marmalade. She shuts it in the cupboard. There's nothing more tonight, sir. But to whom does the solitary traveller make reply? So the elderly nurse knitted over the sleeping baby in Regent's Park. So Peter Walsh snored. He woke with extreme suddenness, saying to himself, The death of the soul. Lord, Lord, he said to himself out loud, stretching and opening his eyes. The death of the soul. The words attached themselves to some scene, to some room, to some past he had been dreaming of. It became clearer the scene, the room, the past he had been dreaming of. It was at Borton that summer, early in the 90s, when he was so passionately in love with Clarissa. There were a great many people there, laughing and talking, sitting around a table after tea, and the room was bathed in yellow light and full of cigarette smoke. They were talking about a man who had married his housemaid, one of the neighbouring squires, he had forgotten his name. He had married his housemaid, and she had been brought to Borton to call. An awful visit it had been. She was absurdly overdressed. Like a cockatoo, Clarissa had said, imitating her. And she never stopped talking. 
On and on she went, on and on. Clarissa imitated her. Then somebody said, Sally Seaton it was, did it make any real difference to one's feelings to know that before they'd married she'd had a baby? In those days, in mixed company, it was a bold thing to say. He could see Clarissa now, turning bright pink, somehow contracting, and saying, Oh, I shall never be able to speak to her again. Whereupon the whole party sitting round the tea table seemed to wobble. It was very uncomfortable. He hadn't blamed her for minding the fact, since in those days a girl brought up as she was knew nothing. But it was her manner that annoyed him. Timid, hard, something arrogant, unimaginative, prudish. The death of the soul. He had said that instinctively, ticketing the moment as he used to do. The death of her soul. Everyone wobbled. Everyone seemed to bow as she spoke, and then to stand up different. He could see Sally Seaton, like a child who has been in mischief, leaning forward, rather flushed, wanting to talk, but afraid. And Clarissa did frighten people. She was Clarissa's greatest friend, always about the place, totally unlike her, an attractive creature, handsome, dark, with the reputation in those days of great daring, and he used to give her cigars, which she smoked in her bedroom. She had either been engaged to somebody or quarrelled with her family, and old Parry disliked them both equally, which was a great bond. Then Clarissa, still with an air of being offended with them all, got up, made some excuse, and went off alone. As she opened the door, in came that great shaggy dog which ran after sheep. She flung herself upon him, went into raptures. It was as if she said to Peter, it was all aimed at him, he knew, I know you thought me absurd about that woman just now, but see how extraordinarily sympathetic I am. See how I love my Rob. They had always this queer power of communicating without words. She knew directly he criticised her. Then she would do something quite obvious to defend herself, like this fuss with the dog. But it never took him in. He always saw through Clarissa. Not that he said anything, of course. Just sat looking glum. It was the way their quarrels often began. She shut the door. At once, he became extremely depressed. It all seemed useless, going on being in love, going on quarrelling, going on making it up. And he wandered off alone, among outhouses, stables, looking at the horses. The place was quite a humble one. The Parrys were never very well off. But there were always grooms and stable boys about. Clarissa loved riding. And an old coachman, what was his name? An old nurse, old Moody, old Goody, some such name they called her, whom one was taken to visit in a little room with lots of photographs, lots of bird cages. It was an awful evening. He grew more and more gloomy. Not about that only, about everything. And he couldn't see her, couldn't explain to her, couldn't have it out. There were always people about. She'd go on as if nothing had happened. That was the devilish part of her, this coldness, this woodenness, something very profound in her, which he had felt again this morning talking to her, an impenetrability. Yet heaven knows he loved her. She had some queer power of fiddling on one's nerves, turning one's nerves to fiddle-strings, yes. He had gone into dinner rather late, from some idiotic idea of making himself felt, and had sat down by old Miss Perry, Aunt Helena, Mr. Perry's sister, who was supposed to preside. There she sat in her white cashmere shawl, with her head against the window, a formidable old lady, but kind to him, for he had found her some rare flower, and she was a great botanist, marching off in thick boots with a black collecting box slung between her shoulders. He sat down beside her and couldn't speak. Everything seemed to race past him. He just sat there, eating. And then, halfway through dinner, he made himself look across at Clarissa for the first time. She was talking to a young man on her right. 
he had a sudden revelation. She will marry that man, he said to himself. He didn't even know his name. For of course it was that afternoon, that very afternoon, that Dalloway had come over. And Clarissa called him Wickham. That was the beginning of it all. Somebody had brought him over, and Clarissa got his name wrong. She introduced him to everybody as Wickham. At last he said, My name is Dalloway. That was his first view of Richard, a fair young man, rather awkward, sitting on a deck chair and blurting out, My name is Dalloway. Sally got hold of it. Always after that she called him, My name is Dalloway. He was a prey to revelations at that time. This one, that she would marry Dalloway, was blinding, overwhelming at the moment. There was a sort of, how could he put it, a sort of ease in her manner to him, something maternal, something gentle. They were talking about politics. All through dinner he tried to hear what they were saying. Afterwards he could remember standing by old Miss Parry's chair in the drawing room. Clarissa came up with her perfect manners like a real hostess and wanted to introduce him to someone, spoke as if they had never met before, which enraged him. Yet even then he admired her for it. He admired her courage, her social instinct. He admired her power of carrying things through. The perfect hostess, he said to her, whereupon she winced all over. But he meant her to feel it. He would have done anything to hurt her after seeing her with Dalloway. So she left him. And he had a feeling that they were all gathered together in a conspiracy against him, laughing and talking behind his back. There he stood by Miss Parry's chair as though he had been cut out of wood, he talking about wildflowers. Never, never had he suffered so infernally. He must have forgotten even to pretend to listen. At last he woke up. He saw Miss Parry looking rather disturbed, rather indignant, with her prominent eyes fixed. He almost cried out that he couldn't attend because he was in hell. People began going out of the room. He heard them talking about fetching cloaks, about its being cold on the water and so on. They were going boating on the lake by moonlight, one of Sally's mad ideas. He could hear her describing the moon, and they all went out. He was left quite alone. Don't you want to go with them, said Aunt Helena. Old Miss Parry, she had guessed. And he turned round, and there was Clarissa again. She had come back to fetch him. He was overcome by her generosity, her goodness. Come along, she said. They're waiting. He had never felt so happy in the whole of his life. Without a word, they made it up. They walked down to the lake. He had twenty minutes of perfect happiness. Her voice, her laugh, her dress, something floating, white, crimson. Her spirit, her adventurousness. She made them all disembark and explore the island. She startled a hen. She laughed. She sang. And all the time, he knew perfectly well, Dalloway was falling in love with her. She was falling in love with Dalloway. But it didn't seem to matter. Nothing mattered. They sat on the ground and talked, he and Clarissa. They went in and out of each other's minds without any effort. And then, in a second, it was over. He said to himself as they were getting into the boat, She will marry that man dully, without any resentment, but it was an obvious thing. Dalloway would marry Clarissa. Dalloway rode them in. He said nothing, but somehow, as they watched him start, jumping onto his bicycle to ride twenty miles through the woods, wobbling off down the drive, waving his hand and disappearing, he obviously did feel, instinctively, tremendously, strongly, all that, the night, the romance, Clarissa. He deserved to have her. For himself, he was absurd. His demands upon Clarissa, he could see it now, were absurd. He asked impossible things. He made terrible scenes. She would have accepted him still, perhaps, 
if he had been less absurd. Sally thought so. She wrote him all that summer long letters, how they had talked of him, how she had praised him, how Clarissa burst into tears. It was an extraordinary summer. All letters, scenes, telegrams, arriving at Morton early in the morning, hanging about till the servants were up, appalling tete-a-tetes with old Mr. Parry at breakfast, Aunt Helena formidable but kind, Sally sweeping him off for talks in the vegetable garden, Clarissa in bed with headaches. The final scene, the terrible scene which he believed had mattered more than anything in the whole of his life, it might be an exaggeration, but still, so it did seem now, happened at three o'clock in the afternoon of a very hot day. It was a trifle that led up to it. Sally at lunch saying something about Dalloway and calling him, my name is Dalloway, whereupon Clarissa suddenly stiffened, coloured in a way she had, and rapped out sharply, we've had enough of that feeble joke. That was all. But for him, it was precisely as if she had said, I'm only amusing myself with you. I've an understanding with Richard Dalloway. So he took it. He had not slept for nights. It's got to be finished one way or the other, he said to himself. He sent a note to her by Sally, asking her to meet him by the fountain at three. Something very important has happened, he scribbled at the end of it. The fountain was in the middle of a little shrubbery, far from the house, with shrubs and trees all round it. There she came, even before the time, and they stood with the fountain between them, the spout, it was broken, dribbling water incessantly. How sights fix themselves upon the mind. For example, the vivid green moss. She didn't move. Tell me the truth, tell me the truth, he kept on saying. He felt as if his forehead would burst. She seemed contracted, petrified. She didn't move. Tell me the truth, he repeated, when suddenly that old man, Brightkopf, popped his head in carrying the times, stared at them, gaped, and went away. They neither of them moved. Tell me the truth, he repeated. He felt that he was grinding against something physically hard. She was unyielding. She was like iron, like flint, rigid up the backbone. And when she said, it's no use, it's no use, this is the end. After he had spoken for hours, it seemed, with the tears running down his cheeks, it was as if she had hit him in the face. She turned, she left him went away. Clarissa, he cried, Clarissa! But she never came back. It was over. He went away that night. He never saw her again. It was awful, he cried, awful, awful. Still, the sun was hot. Still, one got over things. Still, life had a way of adding day to day. Still, he thought, yawning and beginning to take notice. Regent's Park had changed very little since he was a boy, except for the squirrels. Still, presumably there were compensations. When little Elise Mitchell, who had been picking up pebbles to add to the pebble collection which she and her brother were making on the nursery mantelpiece, plumped her handful down on the nurse's knee and scudded off again full tilt into a lady's legs. Peter Walsh laughed out. But Lucrezia Warren-Smith was saying to herself, It's wicked. Why should I suffer? she was asking as she walked down the broad path. No, I can't stand it any longer, she was saying, having left Septimus, who wasn't Septimus any longer, to say hard, cruel, wicked things, to talk to himself, to talk to a dead man on the seat over there. When the child ran full tilt into her, fell flat and burst out crying. That was comforting, rather. She stood her upright, dusted her frock, kissed her. But for herself she had done nothing wrong. She had loved Septimus. She had been happy. 
She had had a beautiful home, and there her sisters lived still, making hats. Why should she suffer? The child ran straight back to its nurse, and Rezia saw her scolded, comforted, taken up by the nurse, who put down her knitting, and the kind-looking man gave her his watch to blow open to comfort her. But why should she be exposed? Why not left in Milan? Why tortured? Why? Slightly waved by tears, the broad path, the nurse, the man in grey, the perambulator, rose and fell before her eyes. To be rocked by this malignant torturer was her lot. But why? She was like a bird sheltering under the thin hollow of a leaf, who blinks at the sun when the leaf moves, starts at the crack of a dry twig. She was exposed. She was surrounded by the enormous trees, vast clouds of an indifferent world, exposed, tortured. And why should she suffer? Why? She frowned. She stamped her foot. She must go back again to Septimus, since it was almost time for them to be going to Sir William Bradshaw. She must go back and tell him, go back to him sitting there on the green chair under the tree, talking to himself, or to that dead man Evans, whom she had only seen once for a moment in the shop. He had seemed a nice quiet man, a great friend of Septimus's, and he had been killed in the war. But such things happen to everyone. Everyone has friends who were killed in the war. Everyone gives up something when they marry. She had given up her home. She had come to live here, in this awful city. But Septimus let himself think about horrible things, as she could do if she tried. He had grown stranger and stranger. He said people were talking behind the bedroom walls. Mrs. Filmer thought it odd. He saw things, too. He had seen an old woman's head in the middle of a fern. Yet he could be happy when he chose. They went to Hampton Court on top of a bus, and they were perfectly happy. All the little red and yellow flowers were out on the grass, like floating lamps, he said, and talked and chattered and laughed, making up stories. Suddenly, he said, Now we will kill ourselves, when they were standing by the river, and he looked at it with a look which she had seen in his eyes when a train went by, or an omnibus, a look as if something fascinated him. And she felt he was going from her, and she caught him by the arm. But going home, he was perfectly quiet, perfectly reasonable. He would argue with her about killing themselves, and explain how wicked people were, how he could see them making up lies as they passed in the street. He knew all their thoughts, he said. He knew everything. He knew the meaning of the world, he said. Then when they got back, he could hardly walk. He lay on the sofa and made her hold his hand to prevent him from falling down. Down, he cried, into the flames, and saw faces laughing at him, calling him horrible, disgusting names from the walls and hands pointing round the screen. Yet they were quite alone. But he began to talk aloud, answering people, arguing, laughing, crying, getting very excited and making her write things down. Perfect nonsense it was, about death, about Miss Isabel Pole. And she could stand it no longer. She would go back. She was close to him now, could see him staring at the sky, muttering, clasping his hands. Yet Dr. Holmes said there was nothing the matter with him. What then had happened? Why had he gone, then? Why, when she sat by him, did he start, frown at her, move away, and point at her hand, take her hand, look at it, terrified? Was it that she had taken off her wedding ring? My hand has grown so thin, she said. I have put it in my purse, she told him. He dropped her hand. Their marriage was over, he thought, with agony, with relief. The rope was cut. He mounted. He was free, as it was decreed that he, Septimus, the lord of men, should be free. Alone, since his wife had thrown away her wedding ring, since she had left him, 
he, Septimus, was alone, called forth in advance of the mass of men to hear the truth, to learn the meaning which now at last, after all the toils of civilization, Greeks, Romans, Shakespeare, Darwin, and now himself, was to be given whole to... To whom? he asked aloud. To the Prime Minister, the voices which rustled above his head replied. The supreme secret must be told to the cabinet. First, the trees are alive. Next, there is no crime. Next, love, universal love, he muttered, gasping, trembling, painfully drawing out these profound truths, which needed, so deep were they, so difficult, an immense effort to speak out, but the world was entirely changed by them for ever. No crime, love, he repeated, fumbling for his card and pencil, when a Sky Terrier snuffed his trousers and he started in an agony of fear. It was turning into a man. He couldn't watch it happen. It was horrible, terrible to see a dog become a man. At once the dog trotted away. Heaven was divinely merciful, infinitely benignant. It spared him, pardoned his weakness. But what was the scientific explanation? For one must be scientific above all things. Why could he see through bodies, see into the future when dogs will become men? It was the heat wave, presumably, operating upon a brain made sensitive by eons of evolution. Scientifically speaking, the flesh was melted off the world. His body was macerated until only the nerve fibres were left. It was spread like a veil upon a rock. He lay back in his chair, exhausted, but upheld. He lay resting, waiting before he again interpreted with effort, with agony to mankind. He lay very high on the back of the world. The earth thrilled beneath him. Red flowers grew through his flesh. Their stiff leaves rustled by his head. Music began clanging against the rocks up here, it is a motor horn down in the street, he muttered, but up here it cannoned from rock to rock, divided, met in shocks of sound which rose in smooth columns. That music should be visible was a discovery, and became an anthem. An anthem twined round now by a shepherd boy's piping. That's an old man playing a penny whistle by the public house, he muttered, which as the boy stood still, came bubbling from his pipe, and then, as he climbed higher, made its exquisite plaint while the traffic passed beneath. This boy's elegy is played among the traffic, thought Septimus. Now he withdraws up into the snows, and roses hang about him. The thick red roses which grow on my bedroom wall, he reminded himself. The music stopped. He has his penny, he reasoned it out, and has gone on to the next public house. But he himself remained high on his rock, like a drowned sailor on a rock. I leant over the edge of the boat and fell down, he thought. I went under the sea. I have been dead, and yet am now alive. But let me rest still, he begged. He was talking to himself again. It was awful, awful. And as, before waking, the voices of birds and the sound of wheels chime and chatter in a queer harmony grow louder and louder, and the sleeper feels himself drawing to the shores of life, so he felt himself drawing towards life. The sun growing hotter, cries sounding louder, something tremendous about to happen. He had only to open his eyes, but a weight was on them, a fear. He strained, he pushed, he looked. He saw Regent's Park before him. Long streamers of sunlight fawned at his feet. The trees waved, brandished. We welcome, the world seemed to say. We accept, we create. Beauty, the world seemed to say. And as if to prove it, scientifically, Wherever he looked, at the houses, at the railings, at the antelopes stretching over the palings, 
beauty sprang instantly. To watch a leaf quivering in the rush of air was an exquisite joy. Up in the sky, swallows swooping, swerving, flinging themselves in and out, round and round, yet always with perfect control, as if elastics held them, and the flies rising and falling. And the sun spotting now this leaf, now that, in mockery, dazzling it with soft gold in pure good temper. And now and again some chime, it might be a motor horn, tinkling divinely on the grass stalks. All of this, calm and reasonable as it was, made out of ordinary things as it was, was the truth now. Beauty, that was the truth now. Beauty was everywhere. It is time, said Rezia. The word time split its husk, poured its riches over him, and from his lips fell like shells, like shavings from a plain without his making them, hard, white, imperishable words, and flew to attach themselves to their places in an ode to time, an immortal ode to time. He sang. Evans answered from behind the tree. The dead were in Thessaly, Evans sang, among the orchids. There they waited till the war was over. And now the dead, now Evans himself. For God's sake, don't come, Septimus cried out, for he could not look upon the dead. But the branches parted. A man in grey was actually walking towards them. It was Evans, but no mud was on him. No wounds. He was not changed. I must tell the whole world, Septimus cried, raising his hand as the dead man in the grey suit came nearer, raising his hand like some colossal figure who has lamented the fate of man for ages in the desert alone, with his hands pressed to his forehead, furrows of despair on his cheeks, and now sees light on the desert's edge, which broadens and strikes the iron-black figure, and Septimus half rose from his chair, and with legions of men prostrate behind him, he, the giant mourner, receives for one moment on his face the whole... But I am so unhappy, Septimus, said Rezia, trying to make him sit down. The millions lamented. For ages they had sorrowed. He would turn round, he would tell them in a few moments, only a few moments more, of this relief, of this joy, of this astonishing revelation. The time, Septimus, Rezia repeated, what is the time? He was talking, he was starting, this man must notice him, he was looking at them. I will tell you the time, said Septimus, very slowly very drowsily, smiling mysteriously. As he sat smiling at the dead man in the grey suit, the quarter struck, the quarter to twelve. And that is being young, Peter Walsh thought as he passed them. To be having an awful scene, the poor girl looked absolutely desperate in the middle of the morning. But what was it about, he wondered. What had the young man in the overcoat been saying to her to make her look like that? What awful fix had they got themselves into, both to look so desperate as that on a fine summer morning? The amusing thing about coming back to England after five years was the way it made, anyhow, the first days, things stand out as if one had never seen them before. Lovers squabbling under a tree. The domestic family life of the parks. Never had he seen London look so enchanting. The softness of the distances, the richness, the greenness. The civilization after India, he thought, strolling across the grass. This susceptibility to impressions had been his undoing, no doubt. Still, at his age, he had, like a boy or a girl even, these alternations of mood. Good days, bad days, for no reason whatever. Happiness from a pretty face, downright misery at the sight of a frump. After India, of course, one fell in love with every woman one met. There was a freshness about them. Even the poorest dressed better than five years ago, surely. And to his eye, the fashions had never been so becoming. 
the long black cloaks, the slimness, the elegance, and then the delicious and apparently universal habit of paint. Every woman, even the most respectable, had roses blooming under glass, lips cut with a knife, curls of Indian ink. There was design, art, everywhere. A change of some sort had undoubtedly taken place. What do the young people think about? Peter Walsh asked himself. Those five years, 1918 to 1923, had been, he suspected, somehow very important. People looked different. Newspapers seemed different. Now, for instance, there was a man writing quite openly in one of the respectable weeklies about water closets. That you couldn't have done ten years ago, written quite openly about water closets in a respectable weekly. And then there's taking out a stick of rouge or a powder puff and making up in public. On board ship coming home, there were lots of young men and girls, Betty and Bertie, he remembered in particular, carrying on quite openly. The old mother sitting and watching them with her knitting, cool as a cucumber. The girl would stand still and powder her nose in front of everyone. And they weren't engaged, just having a good time, no feelings hurt or neither side. As hard as nails she was, Betty what's her name, but a thorough good sort. She would make a very good wife at thirty. She would marry when it suited her to marry, marry some rich man and live in a large house near Manchester. Who was it now who had done that? Peter Walsh asked himself, turning into the broad walk. Married a rich man and lived in a large house near Manchester. Somebody who had written him a long, gushing letter quite lately about blue hydrangeas. It was seeing blue hydrangeas that made her think of him and the old days. Sally Seaton, of course. It was Sally Seaton. The last person in the world one would have expected to marry a rich man and live in a large house near Manchester. The wild, the daring, the romantic Sally. But of all that ancient lot, Clarissa's friends, Whitbreads, Kinderleys, Cunninghams, Kinlock Joneses, Sally was probably the best. She tried to get hold of things by the right end, anyhow. She saw through Hugh Whitbread, anyhow, the admirable Hugh, when Clarissa and the rest were at his feet. The Whitbreads, he could hear her saying. Who are the Whitbreads? Coal merchants, respectable tradespeople. Hugh she detested for some reason. He thought of nothing but his own appearance, she said. He ought to have been a duke. He would be certain to marry one of the royal princesses. And, of course, Hugh had the most extraordinary, the most natural, the most sublime respect for the British aristocracy of any human being he had ever come across. Even Clarissa had to own that. Oh, but he was such a dear, so unselfish, and gave up shooting to please his old mother, remembered his aunt's birthdays, and so on. Sally, to do her justice, saw through all that. One of the things he remembered best was an argument one Sunday morning at Borton about women's rights, that antediluvian topic, when Sally suddenly lost her temper, flared up, and told Hugh that he represented all that was most detestable in British middle-class life. She told him that she considered him responsible for the state of those poor girls in Piccadilly. Hugh, the perfect gentleman, poor Hugh. Never did a man look more horrified. She did it on purpose, she said afterwards, for they used to get together in the vegetable garden and compare notes. He's read nothing, thought nothing, felt nothing, he could hear her saying in that very emphatic voice which carried so much farther than she knew. The stable boys had more life in them than Hugh, she said. He was a perfect specimen of the public school type, she said. No country but England could have produced him. She was really spiteful for some reason, had some grudge against him. Something had happened, he forgot what, in the smoking room. He had insulted her. Kissed her? Incredible. Nobody believed a word against Hugh, of course. Who could? Kissing Sally in the smoking room. If it had been some Honourable Edith or Lady Violet, perhaps. 
but not that ragamuffin Sally without a penny to her name and a father or a mother gambling at Monte Carlo. For of all the people he had ever met, Hugh was the greatest snob, the most obsequious. No, he didn't cringe exactly. He was too much of a prig for that. A first-rate valet was the obvious comparison, somebody who walked behind carrying suitcases, could be trusted to send telegrams, indispensable to hostesses. And he'd found his job, married his honourable Evelyn, got some little post at court, looked after the king's cellars, polished the imperial shoe buckles, went about in knee breeches and lace ruffles. How remorseless life is, a little job at court. He had married this lady, the Honourable Evelyn, and they lived hereabouts, so he thought, looking at the pompous houses overlooking the park, for he had lunched there once, in a house which had, like all Hugh's possessions, something that no other house could possibly have. Linen cupboards, it might have been. You had to go and look at them. You had to spend a great deal of time always admiring whatever it was, Linen cupboards, pillowcases, old oak furniture, pictures which Hugh had picked up for an old song. But Mrs. Hugh sometimes gave the show away. She was one of those obscure, mouse-like little women who admire big men. She was almost negligible. Then suddenly she would say something quite unexpected, something sharp. She had the relics of the grand manner, perhaps. The steam coal was a little too strong for her. It made the atmosphere thick. And so there they lived, with their linen cupboards and their old masters and their pillowcases fringed with real lace at the rate of five or ten thousand a year, presumably, while he, who was two years older than Hugh, cadged for a job. At fifty-three, he had to come and ask them to put him into some secretary's office, to find him some usher's job teaching little boys Latin, at the beck and call of some mandarin in an office, something that brought in five hundred a year. For if he married Daisy, even with his pension, they could never do on less. Whitbread could do it, presumably, or Dalloway. He didn't mind what he asked Dalloway. He was a thorough good sort. A bit limited, a bit thick in the head, yes, but a thorough good sort. Whatever he took up, he did in the same matter-of-fact, sensible way. Without a touch of imagination, without a spark of brilliancy, but with the inexplicable niceness of his type. He ought to have been a country gentleman. He was wasted on politics. He was at his best out of doors, with horses and dogs. How good he was, for instance, when that great shaggy dog of Clarissa's got caught in a trap and had its paw half torn off, and Clarissa turned faint, and Dalloway did the whole thing, bandaged, made splints, told Clarissa not to be a fool. That was what she liked him for, perhaps. That was what she needed. Now, my dear, don't be a fool. Hold this. Fetch that. All the time talking to the dog as if it were a human being. But how could she swallow all that stuff about poetry? How could she let him hold forth about Shakespeare? Seriously and solemnly, Richard Dalloway got on his hind legs and said that no decent man ought to read Shakespeare's sonnets because it was like listening at keyholes. Besides, the relationship was not one that he approved. No decent man ought to let his wife visit a deceased wife's sister. Incredible! The only thing to do was to pelt him with sugared almonds. It was a dinner. But Clarissa sucked it all in, thought it so honest of him, so independent of him. Heaven knows if she didn't think him the most original mind she'd ever met. That was one of the bonds between Sally and himself. And there was a garden where they used to walk, a walled-in place with rose bushes and giant cauliflowers. He could remember Sally tearing off a rose, stopping to exclaim at the beauty of the cabbage leaves in the moonlight. It was extraordinary how vividly it all came back to him, things he hadn't thought of for years. While she implored him, half laughing, of course, to carry off Clarissa, to save her from the Hughes and the Dalloways and all the other perfect gentlemen who would stifle her soul. She wrote reams of poetry in those days 
make a mere hostess of her, encourage her worldliness. But one must do Clarissa justice. She wasn't going to marry Hugh, anyhow. She had a perfectly clear notion of what she wanted. Her emotions were all on the surface. Beneath, she was very shrewd, a far better judge of character than Sally, for instance, and with it all, purely feminine, with that extraordinary gift, that woman's gift, of making a world of her own wherever she happened to be. She came into a room. She stood, as he had often seen her, in a doorway with lots of people round her, but it was Clarissa one remembered. Not that she was striking, not beautiful at all. There was nothing picturesque about her. She never said anything specially clever. There she was, however. There she was. No, no, no. He wasn't in love with her any more. He only felt, after seeing her that morning, among her scissors and silks, making ready for the party, unable to get away from the thought of her. She kept coming back and back, like a sleeper jolting against him in a railway carriage, which was not being in love, of course. It was thinking of her, criticising her, starting again after thirty years, trying to explain her. The obvious thing to say of her was that she was worldly, cared too much for rank and society and getting on in the world, which was true in a sense. She had admitted it to him. You could always get her to own up if you took the trouble. She was honest. What she would say was that she hated frumps, fogies, failures, like himself, presumably, thought people had no right to slouch about with their hands in their pockets, must do something, be something. And these great swells, these duchesses, these hoary old countesses one met in her drawing room, unspeakably remote as he felt them to be from anything that mattered a straw, stood for something real to her. Lady Bexborough, she said once, held herself upright. So did Clarissa herself. She never lounged in any sense of the word. She was straight as a dart, a little rigid, in fact. She said they had a kind of courage which the older she grew, the more she respected. In all this, there was a great deal of Dalloway, of course, a great deal of the public-spirited British Empire tariff reform governing class spirit, which had grown on her, as it tends to do. With twice his wits, she had to see things through his eyes, one of the tragedies of married life. With a mind of her own, she must always be quoting Richard, as if one couldn't know to a tittle what Richard thought by reading the morning post of a morning. These parties, for example, were all for him, or for her idea of him. To do Richard justice, he would have been happier farming in Norfolk. She made her drawing room a sort of meeting place. She had a genius for it. Over and over again, he had seen her take some raw youth, twist him, turn him, wake him up, set him going. Infinite numbers of dull people conglomerated round her, of course, but odd, unexpected people turned up. An artist, sometimes, sometimes a writer. Queer fish in that atmosphere. And behind it all was that network of visiting, leaving cards, being kind to people, running about with bunches of flowers, little presents. So-and-so was going to France, must have an air cushion. A real drain on her strength, all that interminable traffic that women of her sort keep up. But she did it genuinely, from a natural instinct. Oddly enough, she was one of the most thoroughgoing sceptics he'd ever met. And possibly, this was a theory he used to make up to account for her, so transparent in some ways, so inscrutable in others. Possibly, she said to herself, as we are a doomed race, chained to a sinking ship, her favourite reading as a girl was Huxley and Tyndall, and they were fond of these nautical metaphors, as the whole thing is a bad joke, let us, at any rate, do our part. Mitigate the sufferings of our fellow prisoners, Huxley again, decorate the dungeon with flowers and air cushions, be as decent as we possibly can. Those ruffians, the gods, shan't have it all their own way. 
her notion being that the gods, who never lost a chance of hurting, thwarting and spoiling human lives, were seriously put out if, all the same, you behaved like a lady. That phase came directly after Sylvia's death, that horrible affair. To see your own sister killed by a falling tree, all Justin Parry's fault, all his carelessness, before your very eyes, a girl, too, on the verge of life, the most gifted of them, Clarissa always said, was enough to turn one bitter. Later, she wasn't so positive, perhaps. She thought there were no gods, no one was to blame, and so she evolved this atheist's religion of doing good for the sake of goodness. And of course she enjoyed life immensely. It was her nature to enjoy, though goodness only knows she had her reserves, it was a mere sketch, he often felt, that even he, after all these years, could make of Clarissa. Anyhow, there was no bitterness in her, none of that sense of moral virtue which is so repulsive in good women. She enjoyed practically everything. If you walked with her in Hyde Park, now it was a bed of tulips, now a child in a perambulator, now some absurd little drama she made up on the spur of the moment. Very likely she would have talked to those lovers if she had thought them unhappy. She had a sense of comedy that was really exquisite. But she needed people, always people, to bring it out, with the inevitable result that she frittered her time away, lunching, dining, giving these incessant parties of hers, talking nonsense, saying things she didn't mean, blunting the edge of her mind, losing her discrimination. There she would sit at the head of the table, taking infinite pains with some old buffer who might be useful to Dalloway. They knew the most appalling bores in Europe. Or in came Elizabeth, and everything must give way to her. She was at a high school, at the inarticulate stage, last time he was over. A round-eyed, pale-faced girl, with nothing of her mother in her, a silent, stolid creature, who took it all as a matter of course let her mother make a fuss of her, and then said, May I go now, like a child of four? Going off, Clarissa explained, with that mixture of amusement and pride which Dalloway himself seemed to rouse in her, to play hockey. And now Elizabeth was out, presumably, thought him an old fogey, laughed at her mother's friends. Ah, well, so be it. The compensation of growing old, Peter Walsh thought, coming out of Regent's Park and holding his hat in hand, was simply this, that the passions remain as strong as ever, but one has gained, at last, the power which adds the supreme flavour to existence, the power of taking hold of experience, of turning it round slowly in the light. A terrible confession it was, he put his hat on again, but now, at the age of fifty-three, one scarcely needed people any more. Life itself, every moment of it, every drop of it, here, this instant, now, in the sun, in Regent's Park, was enough. Too much, indeed. A whole lifetime was too short to bring out, now that one had acquired the power, the full flavour, to extract every ounce of pleasure, every shade of meaning which both were so much more solid than they used to be, so much less personal. It was impossible that he should ever suffer again as Clarissa had made him suffer. For hours at a time, pray God that one might say these things without being overheard, for hours and days he never thought of Daisy. Could it be that he was in love with her then, remembering the misery, the torture, the extraordinary passion of those days? It was a different thing altogether, a much pleasanter thing. The truth being, of course, that now she was in love with him. And that, perhaps, was the reason why, when the ship actually sailed, he felt an extraordinary relief, wanted nothing so much as to be alone, was annoyed to find all her little attentions, cigars, notes, a rug for the voyage, in his cabin. Everyone, if they were honest, would say the same. One doesn't want people after fifty. One doesn't want to go on telling women they are pretty. 
That's what most men of 50 would say, Peter Walsh thought, if they were honest. But then these astonishing accesses of emotion. Bursting into tears this morning, what was all that about? What could Clarissa have thought of him? Thought him a fool, presumably, not for the first time. It was jealousy that was at the bottom of it. Jealousy which survives every other passion of mankind, Peter Walsh thought, holding his pocket knife at arm's length. She had been meeting Major Ord, Daisy said in her last letter. Said it on purpose, he knew. Said it to make him jealous. He could see her wrinkling her forehead as she wrote, wondering what she could say to hurt him. And yet it made no difference. He was furious. All this pother of coming to England and seeing lawyers wasn't to marry her, but to prevent her from marrying anybody else. That was what tortured him. That was what came over him when he saw Clarissa so calm, so cold, so intent on her dress or whatever it was, realising what she might have spared him, what she had reduced him to, a whimpering, snivelling old ass. But women, he thought, shutting his pocket knife, don't know what passion is. They don't know the meaning of it to men. Clarissa was as cold as an icicle. There she would sit on the sofa by his side, let him take her hand, give him one kiss. Here he was at the crossing. A sound interrupted him. A frail, quivering sound, a voice bubbling up without direction, vigour, beginning or end, running weakly and shrilly and with an absence of all human meaning into Ium faum so fu sui tu imu. The voice of no age or sex, the voice of an ancient spring spouting from the earth, which issued, just opposite Regent's Park tube station, from a tall, quivering shape, like a funnel, like a rusty pump, like a wind-beaten tree, forever barren of leaves, which lets the wind run up and down its branches, singing, Ium faum so, fu sui tu imu, and rocks and creaks and moans in the eternal breeze. Through all ages, when the pavement was grass, when it was swamp, through the age of tusk and mammoth, through the age of silent sunrise, the battered woman, for she wore a skirt, with her right hand exposed, her left clutching at her side, stood singing of love, love which has lasted a million years, she sang, love which prevails. And millions of years ago, her lover, who had been dead these centuries, had walked, she crooned, with her in May. But in the course of ages, long as summer days, and flaming, she remembered, with nothing but red asters, he had gone. Death's enormous sickle had swept those tremendous hills, and when at last she laid her hoary and immensely aged head on the earth, now become a mere cinder of ice, she implored the gods to lay by her side a bunch of purple heather, there on her high burial place, which the last rays of the last sun caressed, for then the pageant of the universe would be over. As the ancient song bubbled up opposite Regent's Park tube station, still the earth seemed green and flowery. Still, though it issued from so rude a mouth, a mere hole in the earth, muddy too, matted with root fibres and tangled grasses, Still the old bubbling, burbling song, soaking through the knotted roots of infinite ages and skeletons and treasure, streamed away in rivulets over the pavement and all along the Marylebone Road and down towards Euston, fertilising, leaving a damp stain. Still remembering how once in some primeval May she had walked with her lover, this rusty pump, this battered old woman with one hand exposed for coppers, the other clutching her side, would still be there in ten million years, remembering how once she had walked in May, where the sea flows now, with whom it didn't matter. He was a man, oh yes, a man who had loved her. But the passage of ages had blurred the clarity of that ancient May day. 
the bright petaled flowers were hoar and silver frosted, and she no longer saw when she implored him, as she did now quite clearly, look in my eyes with thy sweet eyes intently. She no longer saw brown eyes, black whiskers, or sunburnt face, but only a looming shape, a shadow shape, to which, with the bird-like freshness of the very aged, she still twittered, Give me your hand and let me press it gently. Peter Walsh couldn't help giving the poor creature a coin as he stepped into his taxi. And if someone should see, what matter they, she demanded. And her fist clutched at her side, and she smiled, pocketing her shilling, and all peering inquisitive eyes seemed blotted out, and the passing generations, the pavement was crowded with bustling middle-class people, vanished like leaves, to be trodden under, to be soaked and steeped and made mould of by that eternal spring. Iyum faum so, fu sui tui mu. Poor old woman, said Rezia Warren Smith, waiting to cross. Oh, poor old wretch. Suppose it was a wet night. Suppose one's father, or somebody who had known one in better days, had happened to pass, and saw one standing there in the gutter. And where did she sleep at night? Cheerfully, almost gaily, the invincible thread of sound wound up into the air like the smoke from a cottage chimney, winding up clean beech trees, and issuing in a tuft of blue smoke among the topmost leaves. And if someone should see, what matter they? Since she was so unhappy, for weeks and weeks now, Rezia had given meanings to things that happened. Almost felt sometimes that she must stop people in the street, if they looked good, kind people, just to say to them, I am unhappy. And this old woman singing in the street, If someone should see, what matter they? made her suddenly quite sure that everything was going to be right. They were going to Sir William Bradshaw. She thought his name sounded nice. He would cure Septimus at once. And then there was a brewer's cart, and the grey horses had upright bristles of straw in their tails. There were newspaper placards. It was a silly, silly dream, being unhappy. So they crossed Mr. and Mrs. Septimus Warren Smith. And was there, after all, anything to draw attention to them? Anything to make a passerby suspect, here is a young man who carries in him the greatest message in the world, and is, moreover, the happiest man in the world, and the most miserable? Perhaps they walked more slowly than other people, and there was something hesitating, trailing in the man's walk. But what more natural for a clerk, who has not been in the West End on a weekday at this hour for years, than to keep looking at the sky, looking at this, that, and the other? As if Portland Place were a room he had come into when the family are away, the chandeliers being hung in Holland bags, and the caretaker, as she lets in long shafts of dusty light upon deserted, queer-looking armchairs lifting one corner of the long blinds, explains to the visitors what a wonderful place it is. How wonderful, but at the same time, he thinks, as he looks at chairs and tables, how strange. To look at, he might have been a clerk, but of the better sort, for he wore brown boots. His hands were educated. So, too, his profile, his angular, big-nosed, intelligent, sensitive profile. But not his lips altogether, for they were loose. And his eyes, as eyes tend to be, eyes merely, hazel, large. So that he was, on the whole, a border case, neither one thing nor the other. Might end with a house at Purley and a motor car, or continue renting apartments in back streets all his life. One of those half-educated, self-educated men whose education is all learnt from books borrowed from public libraries, read in the evening after the day's work, on the advice of well-known authors consulted by letter. 
As for the other experiences, the solitary ones, which people go through alone, in their bedrooms, in their offices, walking the fields and the streets of London, he had them, and left home, a mere boy, because of his mother. She lied, because he came down to tea for the fiftieth time with his hands unwashed, because he could see no future for a poet in Stroud, and so, making a confidant of his little sister, had gone to London, leaving an absurd note behind him, such as great men have written and the world has read later when the story of their struggles has become famous. London has swallowed up many millions of young men called Smith, thought nothing of fantastic Christian names like Septimus, with which their parents have thought to distinguish them. Lodging off the Euston Road, there were experiences, again experiences, such as change a face in two years from a pink, innocent oval to a face lean, contracted, hostile. But of all this, what could the most observant of friends have said, except what a gardener says when he opens the conservatory door in the morning and finds a new blossom on his plant? It has flowered, flowered from vanity, ambition, idealism, passion, loneliness, courage, laziness, the usual seeds, which all muddled up in a room off the Euston Road, made him shy and stammering, made him anxious to improve himself, made him fall in love with Miss Isabel Pole, lecturing in the Waterloo Road upon Shakespeare. Was he not like Keats, she asked, and reflected how she might give him a taste of Antony and Cleopatra and the rest, lent him books, wrote him scraps of letters, and lit in him such a fire as burns only once in a lifetime, without heat, flickering a red-gold flame infinitely ethereal and insubstantial over Miss Pole, Antony and Cleopatra, and the Waterloo Road. He thought her beautiful, believed her impeccably wise, dreamed of her, wrote poems to her, which, ignoring the subject, she corrected in red ink. He saw her one summer evening, walking in a green dress in a square. It has flowered, the gardener might have said, had he opened the door, had he come in, that is to say, any night about this time, and found him writing, found him tearing up his writing, found him finishing a masterpiece at three o'clock in the morning and running out to pace the streets and visiting churches and fasting one day, drinking another, devouring Shakespeare, Darwin, the history of civilization and Bernard Shaw. This ends Disc 3. Mrs. Dalloway. Disc 4. Something was up. Mr. Brewer knew. Mr. Brewer, managing clerk at Sibley's and Arrowsmith's, auctioneers, valuers, land and estate agents. Something was up, he thought. And being paternal with his young men, and thinking very highly of Smith's abilities, and prophesying that he would, in ten or fifteen years, succeed to the leather armchair in the inner room under the skylight with the deed boxes round him. If he keeps his health, said Mr. Brewer. And that was the danger. He looked weakly, advised football, invited him to supper, and was seeing his way to consider recommending a rise of salary. When something happened, which threw out many of Mr. Brewer's calculations, took away his ablest young fellows, and eventually, so prying and insidious were the fingers of the European war, smashed a plaster cast of Ceres, ploughed a hole in the geranium beds, and utterly ruined the cook's nerves at Mr. Brewer's establishment at Muswell Hill. Septimus was one of the first to volunteer. He went to France to save an England which consisted almost entirely of Shakespeare's plays and Miss Isabel Pole in a green dress walking in a square. There, in the trenches, the change which Mr. Brewer desired when he advised football was produced instantly. 
he developed manliness. He was promoted. He drew the attention, indeed the affection, of his officer, Evans by name. It was a case of two dogs playing on a hearthrug, one worrying a paper screw, snarling, snapping, giving a pinch now and then at the old dog's ear, the other lying somnolent, blinking at the fire, raising a paw, turning and growling good-temperedly. They had to be together, share with each other, fight with each other, quarrel with each other. But when Evans, Rachia, who had only seen him once, called him a quiet man, a sturdy, red-haired man, undemonstrative in the company of women. When Evans was killed, just before the armistice, in Italy, Septimus, far from showing any emotion or recognising that here was the end of a friendship, congratulated himself upon feeling very little and very reasonably. The war had taught him. It was sublime. He had gone through the whole show. Friendship, European war, death, had won promotion, was still under thirty and was bound to survive. He was right there. The last shells missed him. He watched them explode with indifference. When peace came, he was in Milan, billeted in the house of an innkeeper, with a courtyard, flowers in tubs, little tables in the open, daughters making hats. And to Lucrezia, the younger daughter, he became engaged one evening when the panic was on him, that he could not feel. For now that it was all over, truce signed and the dead buried, he had, especially in the evening, these sudden thunderclaps of fear. He could not feel. As he opened the door of the room where the Italian girl sat making hats, he could see them, could hear them. They were rubbing wires among coloured beads in saucers. They were turning buckram shapes this way and that. The table was all strewn with feathers, spangles, silks, ribbons. Scissors were rapping on the table. But something failed him. He could not feel. Still, scissors rapping, girls laughing, hats being made, protected him. He was assured of safety. He had a refuge. But he couldn't sit there all night. There were moments of waking in the early morning. The bed was falling. He was falling. Oh, for the scissors and the lamplight and the buckram shapes. He asked Lucrezia to marry him the younger of the two, the gay, the frivolous, with those little artist's fingers that she would hold up and say, it is all in them. Silk, feathers, what not, were alive to them. It is the hat that matters most, she would say when they walked out together. Every hat that passed she would examine, and the cloak and the dress and the way the woman held herself. Ill-dressing, over-dressing, she stigmatised, not savagely, rather with impatient movements of the hands, like those of a painter who puts from him some obvious, well-meant, glaring imposture. And then, generously, but always critically, she would welcome a shop girl who had turned her little bit of stuff gallantly, or praise wholly with enthusiastic and professional understanding, a French lady descending from her carriage in chinchilla, robes, pearls. Beautiful, she would murmur, nudging Septimus that he might see. But beauty was behind a pane of glass. Even taste, Rezia liked ices, chocolates, sweet things, had no relish to him. He put down his cup on the little marble table, he looked at people outside. Happy, they seemed, collecting in the middle of the street, shouting, laughing, squabbling over nothing. But he could not taste. He could not feel. In the tea shop among the tables and the chattering waiters, the appalling fear came over him. He could not feel. He could reason. He could read Dante, for example, quite easily. Septimus, do put down your book, said Rezia, gently shutting the inferno. 
He could add up his bill. His brain was perfect. It must be the fault of the world, then, that he could not feel. The English are so silent, Rezia said. She liked it, she said. She respected these Englishmen and wanted to see London and the English horses and the tailor-made suits and could remember hearing how wonderful the shops were from an aunt who had married and lived in Soho. It might be possible, Septimus thought, looking at England from the train window as they left New Haven. It might be possible that the world itself is without meaning. At the office, they advanced him to a post of considerable responsibility. They were proud of him. He had won crosses. You have done your duty. It's up to us, began Mr. Brewer, and could not finish, so pleasurable was his emotion. They took admirable lodgings off the Tottenham Court Road. Here he opened Shakespeare once more. That boy's business of the intoxication of language, Antony and Cleopatra, had shriveled utterly. How Shakespeare loathed humanity, the putting on of clothes, the getting of children, the sordidity of the mouth and the belly. This was now revealed to Septimus, the message hidden in the beauty of words, the secret signal which one generation passes under disguise to the next, is loathing, hatred, despair. Dante the same. Aeschylus translated the same. There Rezia sat at the table trimming hats. She trimmed hats for Mrs. Filmer's friends. She trimmed hats by the hour. She looked pale, mysterious, like a lily drowned under water, he thought. The English are so serious, she would say, putting her arms round Septimus, her cheek against his. Love between man and woman was repulsive to Shakespeare. The business of copulation was filth to him before the end. But, Rezia said, we must have children. They had been married five years. They went to the tower together, to the Victoria and Albert Museum, stood in the crowd to see the king open parliament. And there were the shops, hat shops, dress shops, shops with leather bags in the window, where she would stand staring. But she must have a boy. She must have a son like Septimus, she said. But nobody could be like Septimus, so gentle, so serious, so clever. Could she not read Shakespeare too? Was Shakespeare a difficult author, she asked. One cannot bring children into a world like this. One cannot perpetuate suffering or increase the breed of these lustful animals who have no lasting emotions but only whims and vanities, eddying them now this way, now that. He watched her snip, shape, as one watches a bird hop, flit in the grass, without daring to move a finger. For the truth is, let her ignore it, that human beings have neither kindness, nor faith, nor charity, beyond what serves to increase the pleasure of the moment. They hunt in packs. Their packs scour the desert and vanish screaming into the wilderness. They desert the fallen. They are plastered over with grimaces, there was Brewer at the office, with his waxed moustache, coral tie-pin, white slip, and pleasurable emotions, all coldness and clamminess within. His geraniums ruined in the war, his cook's nerves destroyed. Or Amelia, what's her name, handing round cups of tea punctually at five. A leering, sneering, obscene little harpy and the Toms and Berties in their starched shirt fronts oozing thick drops of vice. They never saw him drawing pictures of them naked at their antics in his notebook. In the street, vans roared past him, brutality blared out on placards, men were trapped in mines, women burnt alive. 
and once a maimed file of lunatics being exercised or displayed for the diversion of the populace, who laughed aloud, ambled and nodded and grinned past him in the Tottenham Court Road, each half apologetically yet triumphantly inflicting his hopeless woe. And would he go mad? At tea, Rezia told him that Mrs. Filmer's daughter was expecting a baby. She could not grow old and have no children. She was very lonely. She was very unhappy. She cried for the first time since they were married. Far away, he heard her sobbing. He heard it accurately. He noticed it distinctly. He compared it to a piston thumping. But he felt nothing. His wife was crying, and he felt nothing. Only each time she sobbed in this profound, this silent, this hopeless way, he descended another step into the pit. At last, with a melodramatic gesture which he assumed mechanically and with complete consciousness of its insincerity, he dropped his head on his hands. Now he had surrendered, now other people must help him. People must be sent for. He gave in. Nothing could rouse him. Rizia put him to bed. She sent for a doctor, Mrs. Filmer's Dr. Holmes. Dr. Holmes examined him. There was nothing whatever the matter, said Dr. Holmes. Oh, what a relief. What a kind man. What a good man, thought Rizia. When he felt like that, he went to the music hall, said Dr. Holmes. He took a day off with his wife and played golf. Why not try two tabloids of bromide dissolved in a glass of water at bedtime? These old Bloomsbury houses, said Dr. Holmes, tapping the wall, are often full of very fine panelling, which the landlords have the folly to paper over. Only the other day, visiting a patient, Sir Somebody Something, in Bedford Square... So there was no excuse, nothing whatever the matter, except the sin for which human nature had condemned him to death, that he did not feel. He hadn't cared when Evans was killed. That was worst. But all the other crimes raised their heads and shook their fingers and jeered and sneered over the rail of the bed in the early hours of the morning at the prostrate body which lay realising its degradation. How he had married his wife without loving her, had lied to her, seduced her, outraged Miss Isabel Pole, and were so pocked and marked with vice that women shuddered when they saw him in the street. The verdict of human nature on such a wretch was death. Dr. Holmes came again. Large, fresh-coloured, handsome, flicking his boots, looking in the glass, he brushed it all aside. Headaches, sleeplessness, fears, dreams, nerve symptoms and nothing more, he said. If Dr. Holmes found himself even half a pound below eleven stone six, he asked his wife for another plate of porridge at breakfast. Rezia would learn to cook porridge. But, he continued, health is largely a matter in our own control. Throw yourself into outside interests. Take up some hobby. He opened Shakespeare, Antony and Cleopatra, pushed Shakespeare aside. Some hobby, said Dr. Holmes, for did he not owe his own excellent health, and he worked as hard as any man in London, to the fact that he could always switch off from his patients onto old furniture. And what a very pretty comb, if he might say so, Mrs. Warren Smith was wearing. When the damned fool came again, Septimus refused to see him. Did he indeed, said Dr. Holmes, smiling agreeably. Really, he had to give that charming little lady, Mrs. Smith, a friendly push before he could get past her into her husband's bedroom. So you're in a funk, he said agreeably, sitting down by his patient's side. He had actually talked of killing himself to his wife. Quite a girl, a foreigner, wasn't she? Didn't that give her a very odd idea of English husbands? Didn't one owe, perhaps, a duty to one's wife? 
wouldn't it be better to do something instead of lying in bed? For he had had forty years' experience behind him, and Septimus could take Dr. Holmes's word for it. There was nothing whatever the matter with him. And next time Dr. Holmes came, he hoped to find Smith out of bed and not making that charming little lady, his wife, anxious about him. Human nature, in short, was on him. The repulsive brute with the blood-red nostrils. Holmes was on him. Dr. Holmes came quite regularly every day. Once you stumble, Septimus wrote on the back of a postcard, human nature is on you. Holmes is on you. Their only chance was to escape without letting Holmes know. To Italy. Anywhere. Anywhere. Away from Dr. Holmes. But Rezia couldn't understand him. Dr. Holmes was such a kind man. He was so interested in Septimus. He only wanted to help them, he said. He had four little children, and he had asked her to tea, she told Septimus. So he was deserted. The whole world was clamouring, kill yourself, kill yourself, for our sakes. But why should he kill himself for their sakes? Food was pleasant, the sun hot, and this killing oneself, how does one set about it? With a table knife, uglily, with floods of blood, by sucking a gas pipe? He was too weak, he could scarcely raise his hand. Besides, now that he was quite alone, condemned, deserted, as those who are about to die are alone, there was a luxury in it, an isolation full of sublimity, a freedom which the attached can never know. Holmes had won, of course. The brute with the red nostrils had won. But even Holmes himself couldn't touch this last relic straying on the edge of the world, this outcast who gazed back at the inhabited regions, who lay like a drowned sailor on the shore of the world. It was at that moment, Rezia gone shopping, that the great revelation took place. A voice spoke from behind the screen. Evans was speaking. The dead were with him. Evans, Evans, he cried. Mr. Smith was talking aloud to himself, Agnes the servant girl cried to Mrs. Filmer in the kitchen. Evans, Evans, he had said as she brought in the tray. She jumped, she did. She scuttled downstairs. And Rezia came in with her flowers and walked across the room and put the roses in a vase upon which the sun struck directly, and it went laughing, leaping round the room. She had had to buy the roses, Rezia said, from a poor man in the street. But they were almost dead already, she said, arranging the roses. So there was a man outside, Evans, presumably, and the roses, which Rezia said were half dead, had been picked by him in the fields of Greece. Communication is health. Communication is happiness. Communication, he muttered. What are you saying, Septimus? Rezia asked, wild with terror, for he was talking to himself. She sent Agnes running for Dr. Holmes. Her husband, she said, was mad. He scarcely knew her. You brute! You brute! cried Septimus, seeing human nature, that is, Dr. Holmes, enter the room. Now what's all this about? said Dr. Holmes in the most amiable way in the world. Talking nonsense to frighten your wife? But he would give him something to make him sleep. And if they were rich people, said Dr. Holmes, looking ironically round the room, by all means let them go to Harley Street. If they had no confidence in him, said Dr. Holmes, looking not quite so kind. It was precisely twelve o'clock. Twelve by Big Ben, whose stroke was wafted over the northern part of London, 
blent with that of other clocks, mixed in a thin, ethereal way with the clouds and wisps of smoke, and died up there among the seagulls. Twelve o'clock struck, as Clarissa Dalloway laid her green dress on her bed, and the Warren Smiths walked down Harley Street. Twelve was the hour of their appointment. Probably, Rezia thought, that was Sir William Bradshaw's house with the grey motor car in front of it. The leaden circles dissolved in the air. Indeed it was, Sir William Bradshaw's motor car. Low, powerful, grey, with plain initials interlocked on the panel, as if the pomps of heraldry were incongruous, this man being the ghostly helper, the priest of science. And as the motor car was grey, so to match its sober suavity, grey furs, silver-grey rugs were heaped in it to keep her ladyship warm while she waited. For often Sir William would travel sixty miles or more down into the country to visit the rich, the afflicted, who could afford the very large fee which Sir William very properly charged for his advice. Her ladyship waited with the rugs about her knees an hour or more, leaning back, thinking sometimes of the patient, sometimes, excusably, of the wall of gold mounting minute by minute while she waited the wall of gold that was mounting between them and all shifts and anxieties. She had borne them bravely. They had had their struggles, until she felt wedged on a calm ocean where only spice winds blow, respected, admired, envied, with scarcely anything left to wish for, though she regretted her stoutness. Large dinner parties every Thursday night to the profession, an occasional bazaar to be opened, royalty greeted. Too little time, alas, with her husband, whose work grew and grew, a boy doing well at Eton. She would have liked a daughter, too. Interests she had, however, in plenty. Child welfare, the aftercare of the epileptic, and photography. So that if there was a church building or a church decaying, she bribed the sexton, got the key, and took photographs, which were scarcely to be distinguished from the work of professionals, while she waited. Sir William himself was no longer young. He had worked very hard. He had won his position by sheer ability, being the son of a shopkeeper, loved his profession, made a fine figurehead at ceremonies, and spoke well all of which had, by the time he was knighted, given him a heavy look, a weary look, the stream of patience being so incessant, the responsibilities and privileges of his profession so onerous. Which weariness, together with his grey hairs, increased the extraordinary distinction of his presence, and gave him the reputation, of the utmost importance in dealing with nerve cases, not merely of lightning skill and almost infallible accuracy in diagnosis, but of sympathy, tact, understanding of the human soul. He could see the first moment they came into the room, the Warren Smiths, they were called. He was certain directly he saw the man. It was a case of extreme gravity. It was a case of complete breakdown complete physical and nervous breakdown, with every symptom in an advanced stage, he ascertained in two or three minutes, writing answers to questions, murmured discreetly, on a pink card. How long had Dr. Holmes been attending him? Six weeks. Prescribed a little bromide? Said there was nothing the matter? Ah, yes. Those general practitioners thought Sir William. It took half his time to undo their blunders. Some were irreparable. You served with great distinction in the war? The patient repeated the word war interrogatively. He was attaching meanings to words of a symbolical kind, a serious symptom to be noted on the card. The war? the patient asked. 
the European war, that little shindy of schoolboys with gunpowder. Had he served with distinction? He really forgot. In the war itself, he had failed. Yes, he served with the greatest distinction, Rezia assured the doctor. He was promoted. And they have the very highest opinion of you at your office, Sir William murmured, glancing at Mr. Brewer's very generously worded letter. So that you have nothing to worry you, no financial anxiety, nothing. He had committed an appalling crime and been condemned to death by human nature. I have, I have, he began, committed a crime. He has done nothing wrong whatever, Rezia assured the doctor. If Mr. Smith would wait, said Sir William, he would speak to Mrs. Smith in the next room. Her husband was very seriously ill, Sir William said. Did he threaten to kill himself? Oh, he did, she cried. But he did not mean it, she said. Oh, of course not. It was merely a question of rest, said Sir William. Of rest, rest, rest. A long rest in bed. There was a delightful home down in the country where her husband would be perfectly looked after. Away from her, she asked. Unfortunately, yes. The people we care for most are not good for us when we're ill. But he was not mad, was he? Sir William said he never spoke of madness. He called it not having a sense of proportion. But her husband did not like doctors. He would refuse to go there. Shortly and kindly, Sir William explained to her the state of the case. He had threatened to kill himself. There was no alternative. It was a question of law. He would lie in bed in a beautiful house in the country. The nurses were admirable. Sir William would visit him once a week. If Mrs. Warren Smith was quite sure she had no more questions to ask, he never hurried his patients, they would return to her husband. She had nothing more to ask, not of Sir William. So they returned to the most exalted of mankind, the criminal who faced his judges, the victim exposed on the heights, the fugitive, the drowned sailor, the poet of the immortal ode, the lord who had gone from life to death, to Septimus Warren Smith, who sat in the armchair under the skylight, staring at a photograph of Lady Bradshaw in court dress, muttering messages about beauty. We've had our little talk, said Sir William. He says you are very, very ill, Rezia cried. We have been arranging that you should go into a home, said Sir William. One of Holmes's homes, sneered Septimus. The fellow made a distasteful impression, for there was in Sir William, whose father had been a tradesman, a natural respect for breeding and clothing, which shabbiness nettled. Again, more profoundly, there was in Sir William, who had never had time for reading, a grudge, deeply buried, against cultivated people who came into his room and intimated that doctors, whose profession is a constant strain upon all the highest faculties, are not educated men. One of my homes, Mr. Warren Smith, he said, where we will teach you to rest. And there was just one thing more. He was quite certain that when Mr. Warren Smith was well, he was the last person in the world to frighten his wife. But he had talked of killing himself. We all have our moments of depression, said Sir William. Once you fall, Septimus repeated to himself, human nature is on you. Holmes and Bradshaw are on you. They scour the desert. They fly screaming into the wilderness. The rack and the thumbscrew are applied. Human nature is remorseless. Impulses came upon him sometimes, Sir William asked, with his pencil on a pink card. That was his own affair, said Septimus. Nobody lives for himself alone, 
said Sir William, glancing at the photograph of his wife in court dress. And you have a brilliant career before you, said Sir William. There was Mr. Brewer's letter on the table. An exceptionally brilliant career. But if he confessed, if he communicated, would they let him off then, his torturers? I, I, he stammered. But what was his crime? He couldn't remember it. Yes, Sir William encouraged him, but it was growing late. Love, trees, there is no crime. What was his message? He couldn't remember it. I, I, Septimus stammered. Try to think as little about yourself as possible, said Sir William kindly. Really, he wasn't fit to be about. Was there anything else they wished to ask him? Sir William would make all arrangements, he murmured to Rezia, and he would let her know between five and six that evening, he murmured. Trust everything to me, he said, and dismissed them. Never, never had Rezia felt such agony in her life. She had asked for help and been deserted. He had failed them. So William Bradshaw was not a nice man. The upkeep of that motor car alone must cost him quite a lot, said Septimus when they got out into the street. She clung to his arm. They had been deserted. But what more did she want? To his patience he gave three quarters of an hour. And if in this exacting science, which has to do with what, after all, we know nothing about, the nervous system, the human brain, a doctor loses his sense of proportion, as a doctor he fails. Health we must have, and health is proportion. So that when a man comes into your room and says he is Christ, a common delusion, and has a message, as they mostly have, and threatens, as they often do, to kill himself, you invoke proportion. Order rest in bed, rest in solitude, silence and rest. Rest without friends, without books, without messages. Six months rest. Until a man who went in weighing seven stone six comes out weighing twelve. Proportion, divine proportion, Sir William's goddess, was acquired by Sir William walking hospitals, catching salmon, begetting one son in Harley Street by Lady Bradshaw, who caught salmon herself and took photographs scarcely to be distinguished from the work of professionals. Worshipping proportion, Sir William not only prospered himself, but made England prosper, secluded her lunatics, forbade childbirth, penalised despair, made it impossible for the unfit to propagate their views until they, too, shared his sense of proportion. His, if they were men, Lady Bradshaw's, if they were women. She embroidered, knitted, spent four nights out of seven at home with her son. So that not only did his colleagues respect him, his subordinates fear him, but the friends and relations of his patients felt for him the keenest gratitude for insisting that these prophetic Christs and Christesses who prophesied the end of the world or the advent of God should drink milk in bed as Sir William ordered. Sir William, with his thirty years' experience of these kinds of cases and his infallible instinct, this is madness, this sense, in fact, his sense of proportion. But proportion has a sister, less smiling, more formidable, a goddess even now engaged in the heat and sands of India, the mud and swamp of Africa, the purlieus of London, wherever, in short, the climate or the devil tempts men to fall from the true belief which is her own is even now engaged in dashing down shrines, smashing idols, and setting up in their place her own stern countenance. Conversion is her name, and she feasts on the wills of the weakly, loving to impress, to impose, adoring her own features stamped on the face of the populace. 
At Hyde Park Corner, on a tub, she stands preaching. Shrouds herself in white and walks penitentially disguised as brotherly love through factories and parliaments. Offers help, but desires power. Smites out of her way roughly the dissentient or dissatisfied. Bestows her blessing on those who, looking upward, catch submissively from her eyes the light of their own. This lady, too, Ratia Warren Smith divined it, had her dwelling in Sir William's heart, though concealed as she mostly is, under some plausible disguise, some venerable name, love, duty, self-sacrifice. How he would work, how toil to raise funds, propagate reforms, initiate institutions. But conversion, fastidious goddess, loves blood better than brick, and feasts most subtly on the human will. For example, Lady Bradshaw. Fifteen years ago, she had gone under. It was nothing you could put your finger on. There'd been no scene, no snap, only the slow sinking, waterlogged, of her will into his. Sweet was her smile, swift her submission. Dinner in Harley Street, numbering eight or nine courses, feeding ten or fifteen guests of the professional classes, was smooth and urbane. Only as the evening wore on, a very slight dullness, or uneasiness perhaps, a nervous twitch, fumble, stumble and confusion, indicated what it was really painful to believe, that the poor lady lied. Once, long ago, she had caught salmon freely. Now, quick to minister to the craving which lit her husband's eye so oilily for dominion, for power, she cramped, squeezed, pared, pruned, drew back, peeped through, so that without knowing precisely what made the evening disagreeable and caused this pressure on the top of the head, which might well be imputed to the professional conversation or the fatigue of a great doctor whose life, Lady Bradshaw said, is not his own but his patient's. Disagreeable it was. So that guests, when the clock struck ten, breathed in the air of Harley Street even with rapture, which relief, however, was denied to his patients. There in the grey room, with the pictures on the wall and the valuable furniture under the ground-glass skylight, they learnt the extent of their transgressions. Huddled up in armchairs, they watched him go through, for their benefit, a curious exercise with the arms, which he shot out, brought sharply back to his hip, to prove, if 